The first thing that we want to do is launch Adobe Premiere Pro CC 2015. We want to get comfortable with the working environment, and in order for us to do that, we have to create a new project. Before we create a new project, I'd like to quickly review the welcome screen as it's been updated for this release of Premiere. You'll notice in the Create section you have access to commands for creating new projects or converting existing Premiere Clip projects. You can also open recently worked with projects in this center section. And you also have some options here to sync your settings to Creative Cloud. The other three sections are dedicated to different articles and tutorials to help you learn about new features found within Premiere Pro, how you can get started using the software, and then there's a section that covers tips and techniques for working with Premiere. Like I said, what we want to do is come over and create a new project. So I'm going to select the Create tab. Then within the New section, we can choose Project. That, of course, isn't the only way to access this command. You can also come up to the File menu, and from here, you can choose New, and then you can select Project. Either way, it's going to open this dialog box. The first thing that you can do is you can name your project. We're going to go ahead and name this Fundamentals. And we also can specify the location of this project file. So what we want to do is place this project on the desktop. We can do that by browsing for a new location. Go ahead and click Browse. It's going to open up a dialog box where you can navigate to your desktop. On the desktop, let's go ahead and create a new folder. And we'll call this new folder Fundamentals. And the Fundamentals project file for Premiere will be saved within this directory. So go ahead and click Choose. Once you click Choose, you can verify the path of the location here within the New Project dialog box. Then we have some basic settings that ultimately can be controlled really at any point in time when you're working with Premiere. So I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about some of these options here, we'll leave them set to their defaults. But you'll notice that you can change things like the display format. You can also change the display format for the audio clips that you'll be working with inside of Premiere and how you'll go about capturing video. Something that's really important, however, is how the video rendering and playback will be controlled. If you have a graphics processing unit, a graphics card in your machine, I would suggest selecting that. You'll notice in this case I do. If you don't have a graphics card, you may want to go with software only. You will see a difference in the performance of the application, however. Now, if you have a different card and you select it, you may get a warning dialog box saying that Adobe hasn't tested that graphics card with Premiere. It doesn't mean that it won't work. It simply means that Adobe hasn't had the time to test that particular card with the software. So just be aware of that. You want to be using hardware acceleration if possible. You'll get better results with video rendering and playback. Finally, if you have a fairly robust setup, we are dealing with several external drives. You may want to dedicate those drives for scratch disks, for capturing audio and video, and how you can store video previews and audio previews using these scratch disk options. In this case, I'm just working with an iMac and I have one internal hard drive, so I'm going to use that same hard drive for everything. Once you're happy with your project configuration, you can come down to the bottom and click OK. Once you click OK, the new project is created and you're brought into the Premiere Pro interface. So over the next couple videos, we'll talk about some of these components that you're looking at now inside of Premiere to get you comfortable working with the program. If you've never worked with a professional level nonlinear editor, then the Premiere Pro interface may be somewhat overwhelming. But not to worry. Once you start working inside the program, it makes perfect sense. What I'd like to do in this video is give you a tour of the major components within the interface and give you some tips on how you can find content if you ever get lost while working inside of Premiere. Now, one thing that I will say is that I'm working in the default workspace. If you come up to the Window menu, under the Window menu, you can choose Workspace. The default workspace, when you first launch Premiere Pro, is the Editing Workspace. So hopefully, you're in the same workspace, and if you're not, you can simply choose it 
from this menu. If you were working in the editing workspace and you made some changes, you can always choose Reset to Save Layout. You'll notice that there's several different workspaces, and in Premiere Pro CC 2015, you'll notice that there's a workspace switcher up here towards the top. So let's start off by looking at this area in the top left corner. This is called the Source Monitor, and it gives you the ability to view your clips. You also have the ability to do things like mark in and out points before you decide to use that clip within your sequence. On the right hand side, it looks like the same panel, but it's a little bit different. This is the program monitor, and what this will do is show you what you're building inside of your sequence. So if you're using things like effects or you're doing color correction, you'll be able to preview that here inside the program panel. Down towards the bottom, we have the timeline. This is where you'll assemble your sequence. You'll place your video clips and your audio clips, and you'll start cutting them and putting them together inside the timeline. On the far left, we have the project panel. And the project panel is essentially command central for all your media within your project. All of your video files and audio files will be present here. You'll also notice we have two smaller panels. One, which is right here, is the tools panel. This tools panel allows you to change the tool that you're working with based upon what you're doing here inside the sequence. If you need to select something, what you'll do is make sure that you have the selection tool active within the tools panel. Then you can come over and click to select something. What if you want to cut something? Well, you can come down and choose something like the razor tool. With the razor tool, you'll have the ability to make cuts. So you'll come over and change the tool that you're using based upon what you're trying to perform here inside the sequence. Finally, on the far right, what we have is the audio meter, and this will show you your audio levels within the sequence. For example, if I play this sequence, you'll see the video up here towards the top, and you'll also see your audio levels here inside the audio meter. What's really important when you're working inside of Premiere is what panel has focus, and this can be really confusing to new users. Let's say, for example, you decide you want to change your sequence settings. You would come up to the Sequence menu, and from the Sequence menu, you would choose Sequence Settings, but you'll notice it's grayed out. Why is it grayed out? Well, it's grayed out because the Tools panel at this point has focus. So, that's what Premiere thinks you're working with. If you come over to the timeline and click on that, you'll notice a blue highlight now appears around the timeline or the sequence. Because you're dealing with the sequence now, you should be able to come up to the sequence menu and you'll notice that the sequence settings option is active. So if you come over to the menu system, hoping to choose a particular command and it's grayed out, make sure that the interface is focused in the right area. The other thing that I want to point out is that Premiere Pro has almost an unlimited amount of panels. If you need to access one, all of the panels can be found from the window menu, which is a lot like other Adobe applications. Because I'm working off of a smaller screen resolution, you'll notice that all the tabs within the project panel don't all appear here. If you're working with a larger resolution than I am, and chances are you are, you'll probably see all of the tabs, but in this case, I don't. So if I want to see the other panels that are available within this panel set, what I can do is access this menu on the far right, and this menu will show me the different panels that are available. And to access a panel, all I have to do is select it. Once you select it, if you want to get back to panels you were looking at earlier, again, just come back to this menu and select that panel. And in this case, I'll choose the project panel. The last thing that I'll mention is that each of these panels have submenus available. Next to the panel name within the tab, you'll see this little icon, and if you click it, a menu will open with different options for that particular panel. So hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the Premiere Pro interface. Earlier, we talked about workspaces in Premiere, and workspaces can be nothing more then a starting point for how your environment is configured. So there's some predefined workspaces that Adobe has set up based upon how you're going to be working with Premiere. And again, we have the workspace switcher up here towards the top that we can use. 
We can also come up to the Window menu and from there we can choose workspaces and select a particular workspace. So let's say, for example, we were going to work with a lot of effects. We could choose that workspace and you'll notice that the interface reconfigures and displays panels that you're most likely to use when working with a lot of effects. Likewise, you can also use this workspace switcher. I'm going to come back to editing. It's the workspace that we're going to be using throughout this course. If for some reason you don't like this workspace switcher, you can hide it. Just right click over here in an empty space or control click if you're on a Mac. And you can choose minimize, which will make it available a little bit later on. If you hover over that section, you'll notice a little arrow pointing down. You can click it to re-expand it. But if you want to get rid of it altogether, you can choose close panel and you can even undock it and move it somewhere else. And that's what I really want to talk about. This is a starting point and based upon your situation, you may want to reconfigure this. Perhaps there's one panel that you find that you use more often than not and it's not available by default. Well, you can keep it open. Maybe you have a high resolution monitor and because you have a high resolution monitor, you can fit more panels within the workspace or maybe you have more than one monitor and you want to place some panels on that secondary monitor. All of this is possible. You can completely reconfigure the interface and what's great about it is you can even save it as your own workspace. Let's say for example we wanted to move a panel. We're going to move the tools panel. It's a little sensitive in terms of the way that it works. What you have to do is click and drag in one motion. So I'm going to click and drag up here towards the top. Don't click once because then you select it. You need to kind of select it and drag it all in one movement. So click and drag and as you do that, you'll notice you get highlights within the interface which is an indicator in terms of where you're going to place it. Now if you have the center highlighted, it's essentially going to become a tab within this panel set. It's the same as placing it up here towards the top. This and this do the same thing. If you select this option, it will appear above this current panel. If you do this, it will appear below it. This will make it appear to the left of it and this will make it appear to the right of it. You can also come way up here. You see a different type of highlight and you can dock it towards the top. And when you dock it towards the top, obviously it's taking up way too much space so we can change the size of this panel. Notice I have a two-way arrow. If I click and drag up, I'm shrinking down the tools panel, making more room for other panels within the interface. Now if you reconfigure the editing workspace and you don't like it, you can always get back to the original editing workspace by coming up to the window menu, choosing workspaces, then you would select reset to saved layout. When you do that, you'll notice it's reconfigured to the default layout. So let's say, for example, you make some modifications to the interface. I'll grab the media browser here and then I'll click and drag it just below the source monitor. So notice I have this area highlighted down here towards the bottom. When I let go of the mouse, it appears in between the source monitor and the projects panel set. You can do whatever you want in terms of laying this out in a way that best suits your working habits. Once you're done, you can come up to the window menu and from there you can choose workspaces and then you can select save as new workspace. When you do that, you have to name it and I'll go ahead and call this mats for lack of coming up with something more creative and then I'll click OK. Once I click OK, you'll notice that mats becomes available up here in the workspace switcher. Now there's more workspaces than what we're seeing here in the workspace switcher. And we can access those additional workspaces by clicking this little chevron sign over here on the right hand side. So now I can recall this workspace at any point in time. If I come back to the editing workspace, if I want to get back to mats, I can do that by clicking on mats. Now you'll notice you're not seeing a difference between the two and that's because we changed the editing workspace when we were working with it. So again, we can come up to the window menu and choose workspaces and then select reset to save layout. Then we'll see the differences between the editing workspace and Matt's workspace. Now you can manage these workspaces by the way. Again, I'm going to come back to the editing workspace. It's the workspace that we're going to be using throughout the course. But if we come up to the window menu, from the window menu, we can choose workspaces. Then we can select edit workspaces. And here, 
you have the ability to modify your workspaces in terms of what will appear within the switcher, the bar up here towards the top, and what the overflow menu will contain. But you can also select a workspace here, and with it selected, you can click this delete button to remove it. And you'll notice that I've just deleted the workspace that I created and called mats. So now it's gone. Come down here and click OK, and there you have it. That's how you can work with workspaces inside of Premiere. As we continue our exploration of Adobe Premiere, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time discussing some of the preferences. And this can be somewhat confusing in an application like Premiere because there's so many different areas in which you can configure and optimize settings to best suit your editing habits. With that being said, I'd like to give you a general tour of some of the things that you can configure. And the great thing is, remember, you're working with the Creative Cloud version of Adobe Premiere, which means many of these preferences will be able to sync to Creative Cloud. This will give you access to these preferences on a different machine at some point in time. So that's a really handy thing to have available to you. The first thing that we should take a look at are the general preferences and the general preferences dialog box. Now, what's important to understand about the general preferences dialog box, at least that's what I'm calling it, is it's really the preferences inside of Premiere in that these are application specific. So if you come in and make modifications and changes to these preferences, you're changing these preferences globally inside of Premiere. So whether you're working on a current project or a new project later on down the road, these settings are persistent across those projects. So how do you access this menu? Well, here on the Mac, you'll come up here to the Premiere Pro menu. And from there, you'll choose Preferences. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, you'll go to the Edit menu. And from there, you'll choose the same Preferences option. And you'll notice, of course, that there's several different subcategories that you can choose from. Like many preference dialog boxes in Creative Cloud, no matter which one you choose, it will open the same Preferences dialog box. It's just going to have that category selected for you. So as you can see, there's several different categories for you to come in here and make modifications to make sure that Premiere is working the way that you want it to work. For example, maybe you don't like the welcome screen. And if you don't like the welcome screen, you can come over and choose Open Most Recent when you start up Premiere. And of course, this is in the general category. So these are some of the basic settings that are available here. And to be honest with you, as a new Premiere Pro user, you probably won't have much need to come in here and make modifications. But as you work more and more with Premiere and you get into some of the finer details of the application and some of the finer details of editing, certainly some of these preferences can change how you work within the application. For now, I'm just going to come down here and click Cancel. I just want to point out that these preferences, again, are preferences that you're controlling for the application, not the project. So if you change it now, it will stay that way until you change it back, regardless of the project that you're working on. So because we have application-wide settings, we also have project settings. If you come up to the File menu, from the File menu, you can choose Project Settings. And you'll notice you have two options. You have General and Scratch Disks. Either way, if you select one of those commands, it's going to open the same dialog box, which is the Project Settings dialog box. And in this case, because I selected General, the General tab is active. And if you take a look at this, it's essentially the same options that we configured when we created a new project. So that's the great thing about Premiere. When you create a new project, you're not really boxing yourself into those settings. You can always come back here and make modifications. Likewise, you could do the same for scratch disks. Again, I'll go ahead and click Cancel for now. Not only do you have settings for the project and preferences for the application, you also have sequence-specific settings. And the sequence, remember, is essentially what you're piecing together here inside the timeline. Now, if we take a look at the project panel for just a moment, you can see that we have clips. And these clips can contain video and audio. But as you continue to scroll down and look through the elements within the Projects panel, eventually you'll find a little icon that represents a sequence. You could have as many sequences as necessary 
within a project. And because of that, those sequences can have unique and specific settings. So how do you get to the sequence settings? Well, it's important to make sure that the sequence panel is active. You know it's active because it has a blue highlight around the panel. Then you can come up to the sequence menu and from there you can choose sequence settings. This of course is going to open up a dialog box. This is where you can establish your editing mode. Now what you configure here will ultimately change the media that you drop into the sequence. So if you want to change the time base or the frame size or the shape of the pixels, you have that ability within this dialog box and then all of your media will conform to those settings. Right now it's obvious that I'm working in a 720p workflow based upon the frame size, but if you need to make modifications and changes not only to the video but the audio, these options are available here. Again, I don't want to get hung up on the actual meeting of all of these settings. I just want to point out that these settings exist. It would be overwhelmingly boring if I went through all of these features. We will get there, but we'll talk about them as it makes sense within the course. So again, I'll go ahead and cancel out of this dialog box. So again, we have application preferences, which are available within the preferences dialog box. Then we have project settings that we can configure, and then we have sequence settings. On top of that, we also have settings that we can configure on a panel by panel basis. Remember, each panel has a sub-menu or a contextual menu for that panel. So in this case, in the project panel, maybe I want to change the view of the media. You can do that by choosing something like list. When you do that, you'll notice that everything is now in a list format instead of seeing the little thumbnails. Likewise, if we come up towards the top, we can choose something like preview area. And what this does, if you come over here and select a clip, is it creates a little preview and gives you information about that clip. And this is a common interface element that they no longer display by default, but they used to in earlier versions of Premiere. So if you're missing that feature, this is how you can get it back. I'm going to go ahead and switch this back to the icon view, and I want to turn off the preview area, and I just want to point out a couple other things. Not only can you access this information oftentimes from the contextual menu, but sometimes you can also right click or control click. Now the menu is a little bit different. Many of the options within the menu are the same, but again, it's a different way to access the information. The last thing that I want to point out is that you'll see a little plus sign in the source and program monitors. If you click that, a little panel will open, giving you the ability to configure the buttons that are displayed within these panels. So again, I don't want to get hung up on the actual meaning of all this stuff. I just want you to know that it's there and it exists. At some point, it'll make sense for you to come in and make modifications to customize Premiere. But for now, the important takeaway is to know that they are in fact available to you. In the last video, we looked at the various preferences and options that you can change to customize how Premiere behaves. With that being said, what I'd like to do is show you some preferences that you may want to consider changing right out of the gate. So again, let's return to the preferences dialog box. Here on the Mac, you'll come up to the Premiere Pro menu, and from there you'll choose preferences. And what I'd like to do is go into the general section. Now if you're on a Windows machine, again, you'll go to the edit menu. You'll select preferences, and then you can choose general. Of course, you can always use the keyboard shortcut, which is command comma. It would be control comma on Windows. So here inside the preferences dialog box, there's a couple things that I want to point out. Now, in the United States, most video plays around 30 frames per second. Of course, there are situations where that's different, like 24 frames per second and even a little bit less than that. But if you want to create transitions inside of Premiere, the default duration will be 30 frames, so it's about a second. Depending upon where you are in the world, you may want to reduce this so your video transitions by default are only half a second long. So here I can type in 15. If you're in Europe or Australia, you may be typing in something like 12 frames. The same is true for audio transitions, but Premiere looks at audio in seconds, not frames. So here you can simply type in 0.5. And if you add a lot of 
images to your Premiere projects to create slideshows or something else, you can always increase or decrease the number of frames that that still will have when you drop it into a sequence. Now, don't be alarmed. All of these options can be changed as you edit. If you decide as you're editing that the video transition needs to be longer, we'll just make it longer. These are just the defaults. So those are some changes that I want to make right away. Something else that you should be aware of is you can come over to the appearance category. Here in the appearance category, you can control the brightness of the interface. If you click and drag this to the right, you'll notice that the interface is getting lighter. And you can make it as light as you want it. Likewise, you can make it as dark as you want. I'm going to go ahead and click default. I'm happy with that shading. So I just wanted to control those preferences. You can come down and click OK to exit out of this dialog box. Something else that I want to take a look at is this project panel here. You'll notice that I have a couple different folders, and these folders are referred to as bins. Now, I like working in this icon view. In order for you to look at what's inside of this video bin, chances are you'll double click. And if you double click, it opens up a new bin, a new free floating window. Now, as you can imagine, this could get pretty chaotic pretty quickly. So another option, if you come over and close this new window, you can hold down the Command key on the Mac, Control on Windows. Then when you double click, you'll enter that bin within that panel. Now, how do you get back to where you were? Well, there's a little icon here that lets you go up a level. And if you click it, you'll be able to return back to that original view. Now, this is somewhat alleviated if you come over and choose the list view because you can always expand a particular bin. But if you're like me and you like working in the icon view, you may forget that you have to hold down the keyboard shortcut when double clicking the bin. So as you're working, you're probably going to end up with these windows all over the place. Fortunately, there's a preference to handle that. So again, return back to the Premiere Pro menu and choose preferences. Of course, if you're on the Windows side, you'll go to the edit menu and choose preferences, and then you'll select general. You'll notice in the general preferences, we have an option here in terms of how we deal with bins. And if you double click right now, the default behavior is to open in a new window. Well, what we can do is choose either open in place or open in a new tab. A new tab is a nice option because a new tab will just appear within this docked area. I prefer in place. I think it's easy to navigate once you have this little icon here. And if you want, at that point, you could choose open in new window or tab based upon these modifier keys. So it's completely up to you. It all depends on how you want to work. Those are some settings I like to control right out of the gate as I start working inside of Premiere. But again, it's really a personal preference. We'll take a look at more preferences in context throughout the course. As we continue to talk about preferences, I think it's important to review that you can change your keyboard shortcuts for Premiere. Now, at this point, if you're brand new to editing, you're probably not even concerned with keyboard shortcuts. Frankly, you don't even know how to interact with the interface properly, let alone set up keyboard shortcuts for certain commands. But I think it's important to review it from the beginning so you're aware that this option exists. And if you're moving from other nonlinear editors like Media Composer or Final Cut Pro, you may want to tweak some of the settings inside of Premiere to mimic the behavior of those editors. So how can you change keyboard shortcuts? Well, here on the Mac, you'll come back to the Premiere Pro menu and you'll choose keyboard shortcuts. If you're working on a Windows machine, you'll go to the Edit menu and choose Keyboard Shortcuts. Now this opens up a dialog box and you can see there's all sorts of keyboard shortcuts already set up for you. You can easily scroll through this list to see what's already been configured by default by the engineers at Adobe. But again, you may find that you want to assign a keyboard shortcut to a particular command. Maybe you're performing the same operation three, four, five times within an editing session. And if that's the case, a keyboard shortcut may be in order. So as I scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll notice I'm looking at the Tools section. And the Tools section has some default 
keyboard shortcuts that resemble default keyboard shortcuts in other Adobe applications. For example, the selection tool, which is the selection tool right here when you're working within the timeline. In order for you to access this tool using a keyboard shortcut, you'll use the V key, much like you would in something like Adobe Photoshop. But again, if you want to make changes to any of these keyboard shortcuts or assign keyboard shortcuts to commands that don't currently have them, that's completely possible. You'll notice right now I'm working in the Adobe Premiere Pro default keyboard layout preset. If you access this drop-down menu, you'll notice that Adobe has configured other layout presets for you. For example, you can work with the Premiere Pro CS6 preset. Or, if you're moving from Media Composer, you can use those keyboard shortcuts. And if you're moving from Final Cut Pro 7, again, those keyboard shortcuts are available to you. Now, if you are making the transition from one of these other editors, I would suggest spending some time learning the Premiere Pro keyboard shortcuts if you can. And the reason for that is, as Adobe iterates Premiere Pro, the keyboard shortcuts may move along with those updates and you'll be better suited to work with Premiere Pro natively using the keyboard shortcuts that Adobe had in mind in terms of how people will work with Premiere. But again, it's completely up to you. So if you want to make a change, you can simply select the shortcut. It looks a little strange. You'll see a little X here, but once you click on it, you'll notice it becomes highlighted, and that means that you have the ability at this point to remove the shortcut altogether, or you can change it. Now, if you change it using a keyboard shortcut that already exists, Premiere Pro will let you know. For example, if I type in A here, you'll notice a warning appears down here towards the bottom, which reads the shortcut A was already used by the track select forward tool command. That command will no longer have the keyboard shortcut. So if you do want to make that change, this will no longer have a shortcut. So typically you want to avoid that. I'll go ahead and press V again to set it back to its default shortcut. If you scroll up, again, if you find that you're using a particular command that doesn't contain a keyboard shortcut, you can easily add one. Now, if I come over here and select this command, the toggle maintain pitch during shuttling command, and again, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. As soon as we start cutting inside of Premiere, these commands will make more sense. You typically don't have a single key that you can use because most of them are already occupied by other commands. So if I type in T, for example, you'll notice I get that same warning. But as you begin to add modifiers, the likelihood of that keyboard shortcut being available increases. So if I hold down the control key and the option key and the command key and I type in T, you'll notice I certainly can use that keyboard shortcut. And as soon as you make a change, you'll notice that the layout preset changes to custom. There's also a nice search field here. So for example, if you're working with trim commands, you can type in trim and you'll notice all the trim commands become visible. If you're happy with the changes that you've made, you can always come over here and click save as. And at that point, you can name this layout preset whatever you want. I'll go ahead and type in Matt's preset so I know what it is. I'll click Save. Once I click Save, you'll notice it's available within this menu. If you have it selected and you no longer want it, maybe you are working on a particular project and that project is completed and you no longer need that layout preset, you can always delete it by clicking the Delete button. You'll get a warning dialog box asking you to confirm this operation. I'll go ahead and click OK and that keyboard layout preset has been removed. So again, it's probably not all that important right now for you to come in and customize these keyboard shortcuts, but it is important to realize that that capability exists. So as you work with Premiere Pro, if you feel the need to set up your own keyboard shortcut or customize the existing ones, you know that that's completely possible. Another seriously important preference you should know about before you even get started inside of Premiere is the autosave preference. This really can be a lifesaver, and I think it's worthwhile to take a look at where it's located and how you can tweak it if need be. So again, we need to get into the preferences dialog box, and if you're on the Macintosh, you have to come up to the Premiere Pro menu and choose preferences. You might as well choose autosave from the sub menu. 
If you're on the Windows side, you'll go to the Edit menu, choose Preferences, and from the Sub menu, you'll select Auto Save as well. And that will open up the Preferences dialog box with the Auto Save category pre-selected. So you'll notice right now, by default, Automatically Save Projects is selected. And it's going to automatically save your projects every 15 minutes. And you'll notice that there's a maximum number of project versions it will save, which is 20. Now this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to go backwards in time if necessary. These are the defaults. If you want to change them, go ahead and do it. Maybe you want to automatically save your projects every 10 minutes or maybe every 25 minutes. You can come in and make these modifications. You can also save backup projects to the Creative Cloud, which can be really useful if you work on multiple machines. Again, I'll go ahead and leave that deselected for now. So I'm going to leave the defaults configured the way that they are, but this is a really helpful way to kind of create a safety net for yourself as you're working inside of Premiere. Again, it's inside the Preferences dialog box. It's the Auto Save category. You may want to come in and customize it if you find that you want more copies saved or you want Premiere to save it more or less frequently. Now that you have a good handle on the preferences and keyboard shortcuts and how you can configure Premiere Pro to best suit your editing habits, you may want to synchronize your settings to your Creative Cloud account. That way, if you're working on Premiere on a different machine, you'll have those settings available to you. So how can you synchronize your settings? Well, there's two options, really. You'll notice here, down towards the bottom left corner of the interface, there's a little Creative Cloud icon. And if you hover over it, a tooltip will appear that reads Sync Settings. And if you click on it, you get a menu of options. Those same options are available under the Premiere Pro menu or the Edit menu on the Windows side. And you can choose Sync Settings. And you have a couple different options. You can sync to a different Creative Cloud account, or you can manage your sync settings, or you can manage your Creative Cloud account. Now, if you choose this last option, it's just going to bring you to the creative.adobe.com website where you can log in as usual. Again, if we come back to this menu and from the sync settings, we choose manage sync settings. What that's going to do is bring you to a specific location within the Preferences dialog box. And here, you can specify what settings you want to sync to the Creative Cloud. Again, I'll go ahead and cancel out of this. Let's return back to that menu. And here, from Sync Settings, what we can do is choose Sync Settings Now. Now, when you choose this, you probably have to log in to your Creative Cloud account using your Adobe ID. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. And once I click OK, a dialog box will appear saying that Premiere must close the current project to download and apply these settings. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. The project will close out. The settings will synchronize, which will just take a moment, and Premiere Pro will reopen. And so once your settings are done synchronizing, if you ever make a change to your preferences, you'll have the option, if you synchronize again, to either upload the changes that you've made or you can download a fresh copy of the settings from the Creative Cloud. So that's how you can easily manage your preferences across multiple devices. You simply have to synchronize your preferences to the Creative Cloud. There's so many variables when it comes to good performance inside of Premiere Pro that it's hard to say what you should do to get the most performance out of the application. It really depends on the media that you're using and the types of drives that you're using. But there are some base level things that you can take a look at to ensure that you're going to get at least a decent level of performance out of the application. The first thing is to take a look at your system specifications. Now I'm on a Mac, so you can do that by coming up to the Apple menu and choosing About This Mac. Here you can see that I have a 3.1 GHz Intel Core i7 processor. You can have multiple processors, and oftentimes processors will have multiple cores. You'll also notice that I have 16 GB of memory. Really, the name of the game when it comes to Premiere is having as much memory as possible. Now, 
Premiere can really utilize up to 192 gigabytes of RAM. Now, if you have 192 gigabytes of RAM, that means you've spent a fortune on your system. So that's probably not realistic. If you can get somewhere around 16 gigabytes, that's definitely a place where you want to be. But the more memory that you can throw at Premiere, the more memory it will use and ultimately give you better performance. So processor speed is one factor. The amount of RAM that you have is another factor. The other factor in terms of hardware would be your graphics card. Again, the more RAM you have here, the better. And if you're working with a desktop computer, oftentimes you can swap out your graphics cards for better graphics cards, and some laptops even support that. Now, I'm working with an iMac. The graphics card that comes with the iMac, at least as of this recording, is fairly sufficient, but again, there's so many variables. It depends upon what kind of footage that you're using, and even your hard drive speeds can play a role. Because I'm working off of this iMac, it has a solid state drive which ultimately gives you pretty good performance when compared to traditional hard drives. But there's other hard drive systems that you could be using like RAID systems that will also increase the performance of Premiere. But ultimately, if you're trying to get the best performance, remember the amount of memory that you have, the amount of processing speed that you have, and the performance speed of your graphics card and hard drives will ultimately play a role in how responsive Premiere Pro is. In this chapter, we're going to focus on how we can import media into Adobe Premiere. Before we do that, though, we're going to create a new project and we're going to create a new sequence and talk a little bit about sequence settings. So here I am on the welcome screen. I'm going to go ahead and click New Project. This, of course, opens up the New Project dialog box that we talked about earlier. We want to name this project in a way that makes sense. Really, we want to name the project in a way that's easy to identify what it represents when we look at the actual Premiere file. So we're going to be editing a video on how to draw. So I'm just going to go ahead and call it draw. You could be more specific if you want. You could call it how to draw. It's really up to you. Then what you want to do is come down here and click OK. And when you click OK, you'll be brought to the Premiere Pro interface. I just want to point out one thing. When you create a new project, the file is called a PRPROJ file for a Premiere project. So here we can see draw.prproj. So that file is generated for you. Coming back to Premiere, if you want to be able to edit your videos, you need to be able to create a sequence. And right now, if we take a look at the timeline, it reads no sequences. So. What do we have to do? We have to create a sequence. Unfortunately, there's several different ways that you can create sequences inside of Premiere. Much like anything else, Adobe gives you more than one way to do something. What you can do is come up to the File menu, and from the File menu, you can choose New, and then you can select Sequence. Command-N or Control-N would be the keyboard shortcut. This, of course, will open up the New Sequence dialog box, and this is really great if you know the format of video that you're working with. For example, if you shoot using a digital SLR, you could expand this and choose the resolution. Are you shooting in 1080p, 720p, or 480p? And once you expand it, you have a couple different options in terms of the frame rate associated with that resolution. Now, what if you don't know the actual video format specifications? Well, fear not. Adobe's made this really simple for you. If you do know it, you can select it and name your sequence here. But if you don't, you can cancel out of this dialog box. You don't even have to come into this dialog box technically. So once you cancel out of it, what you want to do is import some type of media. And like I said, we're going to talk about this in great detail over the next couple videos. But for right now, what I'd like you to do is come up to the file menu. And from the file menu, you can choose Import, Command-I or Control-I would be the keyboard shortcut. And if you downloaded the exercise files from our website, go into the Video folder. And inside the Video folder, there's all sorts of clips in there. Go ahead and highlight one and click Import. Once you click Import, you'll see the clip here in your project panel. If you're looking at your project panel in the thumbnail view, as you hover over the clip, you'll actually be able to see it play as you drag your cursor to the left and to the right. So that's kind of cool. 
But how can you create a new sequence based upon this media? Again, there are several different options. One option is to simply drag the clip down here to this little new button that will create a new sequence. You could also right click or control click on that clip and you'll notice there's an option within the contextual menu to create a new sequence from the clip. Or better yet, which is probably the easiest way, is to simply click and drag this clip into the timeline. When you let go of the mouse, the new sequence is created. Now once the new sequence is created, you'll notice it's named the same as the clip. So you may want to change the name of the sequence. We'll go ahead and just type in self for self portrait. Now you'll notice that that sequence name has been updated. So what you can do now is verify the sequence settings. You can do that by coming up to the sequence menu. Under the sequence menu, you can choose sequence settings. This will open up the sequence settings dialog box and you'll notice that everything is configured based upon this media. Now what's important if you're going to be working in this way is that the first clip that you drag into the sequence should be the format that most of your clips are in. Meaning if you have some legacy content or standard definition video content that you want to incorporate into this sequence, make sure that you're dropping in the media file that contains the format for the majority of your clips because all other clips that you use within this sequence will conform to the sequence settings. So that's how you can approach creating new sequences inside of Premiere. Like I said, throughout the rest of this chapter, we're going to focus on how we can import media into the application. Importing media into Premiere Pro is a relatively easy process. What's really important to understand when you import media into the program is that the actual files are not becoming part of your Premiere project file. Again, if we take a look up here towards the top, we can see that we're working in this Premiere project called Draw. If we import media, that media is not part of this file. This file just contains information about the types of media that you're using and how you've cut that media within a sequence. That's the information stored within the Premiere file. If you import media, you're essentially creating an alias to the location of that media. It's a lot like the relationship between a shortcut that you create in Windows and the actual program file. You can also think of it as an HTML document if you come from the web world. In an HTML document, you don't place images within that HTML document. Rather, the HTML document makes reference to the location of the image. And that's all that Premiere is doing. Even though the command is called import, you're not really taking those files and placing them in Premiere. You're simply telling Premiere where they are. Now, before we really get into importing media, what I'd like to do is just spend a moment looking at the different types of media that you can use within the program. We're not going to look at all the different types of media, but I want to get you comfortable with the most popular and how Premiere displays this information so you can work more effectively while you're editing. So we need to focus on the project panel, of course. There are a couple different views down here towards the bottom. You can look at the list view, which I'm looking at now, and you can also look at the icon view. It's really up to you in terms of what view you prefer as you work. But for the purposes of this video, I want you to be in the list view. And once you're in the list view, we really want to focus on this panel. So go ahead and press the tilde key to make that panel take up the entire screen. So you'll notice I have several different directories or folders, and these folders are referred to as bins. Now you can expand the bins by clicking these little triangles so you can see all of the content within those bins. And so looking at this, you can see that we have different types of media, and the different types of media are labeled differently based upon color, and they're also displayed differently with these little icons. So just looking at the different bins, you can see that we have animated graphics, which really is a video, but it doesn't contain any audio. And you can see that because you just see a little film strip. Likewise, we have simple audio files that don't contain any video, and all you see is a little green 
box with a waveform, which is an indicator that this file contains nothing more than audio. Then we have a sequence. This little icon represents the sequence. You can have nested sequences. And in this case, I'm simply noting a nested sequence with parentheses. I'm naming this a nested sequence, essentially. But this little icon represents that this file or this asset is, in fact, a sequence. You can also have still images or graphics. In this case, I have a PNG file. It looks like a little piece of paper with a couple different shapes on it. Down here towards the bottom, we have video files or movie files, which contain a film strip, much like the animated graphics file I have up here, and a waveform, which is an indicator that this video file contains both audio and video, unlike this element down here towards the bottom, which is nothing more than video. It doesn't contain any audio. So a quick way to be able to view what media types these assets are, you can come up to the top here and right click or control click on the header area. You'll get a contextual menu that reads metadata display. If you select that, you can then expand the Premiere Pro project metadata. Don't get overwhelmed by this dialog box, by the way. You can see that there's a ton of different stuff in here. As you work inside of Premiere, you may find the need to come in here and make modifications. But for now, we just want to come over and check media type. After doing that, you can come over and click OK. And once you click OK, you can see that this is a bin. This is a video. Oddly enough, Premiere calls video content without audio video, and it calls media content that contains both audio and video a movie. We then have a still image. We have a sequence. We also have video in movies down here. So not only can you see the media type based upon this label here, but there's also a label based upon color. If you have video without audio, you have a little purple box. If you have simple audio without any video, you get a green box. Still image is purple. And a file that contains audio and video is blue. And a bin, of course, is orange. So there's all these visual cues that help you understand what type of asset you're about to select within this panel. And like I said earlier, you have a couple different views. Right now, we're in the list view. You can switch back to the icon view. Here we can see all of our different bins. If we double click, we enter that bin, and then we see all the thumbnails. And again, like I said earlier, what's nice about this is if you hover over the thumbnail, you can actually scrub through the video clip. So there you go. I'm going to go ahead and collapse this back down by pressing the tilde key again. And now you have a better understanding as to the information that Premiere is trying to relay to you within this panel. Again, I can move up a level by clicking this button, or if I want, I can simply switch back to the list view. Earlier, we looked at the different types of media that you can import into Premiere and how Premiere displays that media. Well, what we want to do in this video is explore in greater detail how you can go about importing media. Now, the process is fairly straightforward, and like many things, there's several different ways to do it. Let me show you a couple different ways. Of course, you can come up to the File menu, and from the File menu, you can choose Import. The keyboard shortcut is Command-I. It would be Control-I on Windows. This will open up a dialog box in here you can find the pieces of media that you want to import. And what you would do is simply select it and click Import. Now, if there's more than one file that you want to import, you can select a range of files by holding down the Shift key and selecting on another file. And you'll notice all of the files in between those two are selected. Or if you want to kind of come through and select different files that aren't next to one another, you would hold down the Command key on the Mac it would be the control key on Windows. And at that point, you can click Import. It'll take a moment, but again, what Premiere is doing is creating the relationship between this project and the location of those media files. I don't want to do that right now, so I'm going to go ahead and undo that Command Z or Control Z on Windows. Another way is to open up a Finder window on the Mac, Windows Explorer on the Windows side and find a particular file. So in this case, if I come over to the desktop, I can go into the Fundamentals folder. And in here, I have a video folder. And I can do the same thing, essentially. I can select one file or a range of files or multiple files, whatever the case may be. And then all you have to do is drag those files into your project panel. And once you do that, you'll notice they appear. 
so you can drag and drop, which is also a nice way to import your media. Now, if you don't have these exact files on your computer, that's fine. I'm not importing the files for the project that we're going to be working on together. We're just kind of going through this as an example so you're comfortable with the process of importing media. We'll import all the media for our project a little bit later on. So with that being said, again, what I'm going to do is get rid of all of those files. All I have to do is come down here and click on the trash can and all the selected pieces of media will be removed. Finally, what I find to be the best way to work when importing media is to use the media browser. So come over and select that tab and you can press the tilde key to go into a full screen view. And here you have essentially a browser for your system file. So in this case, I'm going to go into the local drive. Within the local drive, I can then go into a specific user account. Once I go into that user account, I can navigate to the desktop. In the desktop, I have that directory. And if you need a little bit more room here, you can click and drag this to the right. I have this video folder. And if I expand the video folder, you won't see the files here in this view. This tree is essentially showing you different directories. So if you want to see the content within a particular directory, instead of clicking on this triangle, you'll select that particular folder. And you'll notice over here on the right-hand side, we're getting a view of all of the assets. Now, right now, we're in the thumbnail view. So you have this hover scrub feature that gives you the ability to scrub through the video clip. If you have a lot of video clips, like I do here, you can come down and choose the list view. Now we're looking at all of these assets in a list view. So if you want to import these elements, you have a couple different ways that you can do it. But if you select the files that you want to use, you can then right click or control click on those files and you can choose import. And once you choose import, again, it will take a moment, but if you come back to the project panel, you'll notice that those assets have been imported. Again, I'm going to go ahead and remove these. I just want to show you a couple different things that you can do. So again, if you want to select more than one file, you'll hold down the Command key or the Control key on Windows. If there's a range of files, you'll select one, and then you hold down the Shift key and select another, and the entire range will become selected. If you're in the icon view, Essentially, the same thing is true, but you also have the ability to click and drag a marquee around certain elements. And again, if you want to add to that selection, you'll hold down the Command key on the Mac. It's Control on Windows. That gives you the ability, again, to select the clips discontiguously. So if you wanted the first one and the third one, the Command key allows you to do that. If you want the first three, select the first one, hold down the Shift key, and select the third one, and you select that range. So this gives you the ability to import not only on a clip-by-clip -clip basis, but also multiple clips within a particular directory. But what if you already have your files organized? It's not uncommon to organize your media in the Finder or in Windows Explorer as you're capturing your media or transferring it over from a card. In this case, you can see that I have an audio directory and an images directory and a video directory. So how can you go about importing each of these directories? So what you would do is come over and select the parent directory. Then you have the ability to select each of those directories here inside this view by holding down the Command key on the Mac or the Control key on Windows. And at that point, if you right click or Control click, you can choose Import. And once you import those files, if you come back to the project panel, you'll notice all those bins are already set up for you. So if you do spend the time organizing your media outside of Premiere, you can certainly utilize all the work that you did outside of Premiere, and you can simply select the directories or bins that you want to import. And all that time you spend organizing your media is preserved once you get it here inside of Premiere. So that's how you can go about importing media if it already exists within your hard drive. But what if the media doesn't exist within your hard drive? Well, we'll take a look at that in the next video. Earlier, when we looked at how we could import footage into Premiere, that footage was already on our hard drives. Now, you should take media off a card and place it on your hard drive, because remember, Premiere Pro doesn't 
have the actual footage file in the project file, but rather a reference to where that footage file is. So it's always a good idea to put your card into a card reader and copy that data onto a hard drive somewhere. Now, we've been working with footage from a DSLR camera, and DSLR cameras make perfect sense, meaning that it ultimately produces a format that you can look at and quickly identify as something that you can use on your computer. I'm going to hide or minimize Premiere here for a second. In this media folder, we have a video folder, and if we look at this by expanding it, we can see that we have MP4 files and QuickTime movies. These are self-contained videos. We could open these videos in other applications like QuickTime, so on and so forth. But what happens if you're working with a different format altogether? Maybe you're not using a DSLR. In this case, I have a directory called Card, and this is footage that was shot with a Panasonic P2. This is what it gives you. It gives you a whole bunch of different directories. And looking at this, you really have no idea in terms of how you can go about opening up the video file because the video file is made up of all the data that's found within all of these directories. In fact, if you expand the video folder, you'll find these MXF files, which really mean nothing. There's no program on your computer that can open these. So how do you go about importing this? Well, fortunately, Premiere makes it incredibly easy. Let's come back to Premiere for a moment. Inside of Premiere, what I'd like you to do is go into the media browser, and I'm going to press the tilde key to make this take up the entire screen. On the desktop, we have several different directories. If I click the card directory, now remember, the card directory on the desktop contained nothing but a bunch of different directories. But if I click the card directory now, you'll see instead of having a bunch of different directories, we see the actual video footage. So Premiere takes all of the pain out of figuring out how to get this video content into your editor. So I just wanted to point that out. And I also want to stress that if you have information, video files on a card, pop it into a card reader and copy that data onto a hard drive. So the next time you open Premiere, it'll look for that video footage on the hard drive opposed to a media card, which you're most likely going to eject at some point. As we continue to talk about how we can import media into Premiere Pro, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can import still images. Now, the big difference between a still image and an actual video or audio file is that a still image doesn't have duration associated with it by default, meaning the file itself doesn't have a duration like a video file. That's why inside your preferences dialog box again if you're on the mac side you'll go to premiere pro then you'll select preferences then general if you're on the windows side you'll go to the edit menu you'll select preferences and then you'll choose general here in the general section of the preferences dialog box you can specify the default duration of a still image in frames so if you're working with ntsc or pal or whatever your frame rate is you want to make sure that you set this to the appropriate number of frames for the duration you want the image to be. If you want it to be 5 seconds, 150 makes sense in most formats. If you want it to be longer or shorter, you would make a modification here. For our purposes right now, I'm just going to come over here and cancel out of this dialog box. And what I want to do is show you how you can import the actual image. The process is very similar to importing video or audio. You can come up to the file menu and from the file menu you can choose import command i or control i would be the keyboard shortcut you can also drag and drop from a system window or if you have some available gray space here within the project panel you can double click and that will open up the import dialog box so here what we want to do is come into this images directory and you have this directory if you downloaded the exercise files You'll notice that many of these images, whether they be PNG files or JPEGs, they're already set to 720p dimensions, 1280 by 720. It's a good idea to format your images based upon the desired dimensions before you bring them into Premiere, saving you some time once you have them in Premiere. You'll notice, however, Bones, for example, 
is not set to any standard resolution dimensions. So what Premiere will do is either scale this image or it will add crop bars either on the left or right or the top or the bottom. If I come over and click import, once I click import, let's say I have a sequence that's set to 1080p. I'll just go ahead and drop this clip in here. This is going to set it to 1080p because that is the dimensions of this clip as you can see based upon the tooltip. If I hover over bones.png, this tooltip is saying it's 1438 by 1214 and it's zero hours. I'll go ahead and hover over this again. It's zero hours, zero minutes, five seconds in zero frames. If I double click it to load it into the source monitor, you can see that the aspect ratio is different than that of the actual media that I'm cutting up here in the sequence. So if I drop this into the sequence, what Premiere will do, like I said, is add these bars to compensate for the differences in dimensions. The other thing that I want to point out is that you can work with PSD files. Because Adobe makes both Premiere and Photoshop, there's some nice integration features between the two. If we come up to the file menu, from the file menu, again, we can choose import. And what I'd like you to do is select title.psd. And if you look at this thumbnail, you can see that the overall size of this image is 1280 by 720. It will fit nicely in a sequence set to 720p. If you come over and click import, a dialog box will appear and you have a couple different options. You can merge all the layers so you're working with one image asset once you have it imported. Or you can merge specific layers if you want. Notice these little thumbnails are showing you the actual dimensions of the content within each layer. You could import all of these as individual layers and if you choose that option you now have a footage dimensions drop down menu here where you can choose document size or layer size. And we'll talk about this in greater detail in just a bit. You can also import all of these into a sequence. For our purposes, we're going to go with that option. Once you click import, you'll notice we have a title bin here. Inside the title bin, we have all the separate image assets. So if I double click on sketches, you can see the sketches portion of that image. This particular asset was on its own layer inside the Photoshop document. If I come over and double click on something else like gestures.psd, I can see that text down here in the bottom left hand corner. If I come over here and double click on the sequence, you can see that they're stacked on top of one another and the sequence looks much like the composition that we had inside of Photoshop. But remember, we specified that we wanted to import these based upon the document dimensions. So how is that different than the layer dimensions. Again, if we come back up to the file menu and we choose import, this time I'm going to select the same title.psd file. And once I come over and click import, I'm going to get that same dialog box. But here I'm going to choose sequence again, but now I'm going to choose layer size. And if we take a look at these thumbnails, we can see that each of the components within the overall PSD take up very little space. Gestures, for example, is not 1280 by 720. It's just a fraction of that. So if you click OK, once you click OK, we have another new bin with another new sequence. But if I double click this sequence, you can see what Premiere does. It centers all the individual components within the program. So now gestures, which is small over here in the bottom left hand corner, is centered here in the middle of the actual program. So that should give you some idea as to what those options mean when you import a PSD file. But outside of that, the way you import an image asset is exactly the same process as importing audio files or video files into Premiere. Something that can be really useful when working inside of Premiere is having the ability to import content from other Premiere projects or importing sequences from other Premiere projects. Now there's a couple different ways that we can do this. I'm going to go ahead and relaunch Premiere Pro. And remember, by default, we'll be greeted with the welcome screen. And from this welcome screen, I can create a new project. I'm going to go ahead and call this import. I'm going to save it in the fundamentals directory. 
I'll leave everything else set to the defaults and then I'll come over and click OK. Now what I want to do is import content from another Premiere Pro project. So there's a couple different ways that you can do this. Of course you can just come up to the file menu and from there you can choose import. When you choose import, you want to navigate to the fundamentals directory and in there you'll see that draw project that we created earlier. Now if you select that Premiere Pro project, you can click import and you'll notice that a new dialog box appears. Here you can import the entire project and this can be helpful if you work on a weekly program where you're producing essentially the same content, you're just swapping out footage. but maybe the graphics are all the same, things along those lines, it could really be treated as a template. Or if you want, you can import just a specific sequence within the project. Maybe this particular Premiere Pro project has 20 different sequences and we only need access to one of those sequences. Well, what you can do is select that second radio button and then you can click OK. Once you click OK, it'll build out the directory of that project what you want to do is select that sequence and then you can come over and click OK. Once you click OK, you'll notice that the project is built out for you. And not only do you have this sequence, but you have all the supporting assets as well within that sequence. So that's certainly one way that you can work with other Premiere Pro projects. I'm going to go ahead and undo that, Command Z or Control Z on Windows. Another way, and a way that I think is a little bit more useful is to use the media browser. If you come over to the media browser and go into the full screen mode by pressing the tilde key, what you can do is navigate, in this case, your local hard drive and then I can go into the specific user account and of course all the content I'm looking for is on the desktop in the fundamentals folder. Here I can select draw. Once you select draw, you'll notice you see all the different directories associated with that Premiere Pro project. You could also expand the hierarchy here to see all the different directories, but now you have the ability to navigate into a specific bin, like the video bin, and you'll see all the different video files associated with that project. Now what's great about this is you have the ability to come in here and select particular clips that you want to use. You don't have to select all of them, you can just choose the ones that you want to use. So you now have access to the Premiere Pro project, much like you would have access to a directory filled with media. There's really very little difference there. So I just wanted to point that out, that Premiere Pro is incredibly flexible and you have the ability to import other projects, other sequences from projects, and of course you also have access to the media associated with the project. The last thing that I'll say is if you do choose a particular media element from another project, in this case I'll choose this, I'll right click or control click and choose import. Once you import, Premiere Pro is rewriting the alias or the path to that media element. So here inside the new Premiere Pro project that I'm working on, this video file has its own path to the location of the actual media. It's not reliant on the other Premiere Pro project. So if something changes within that project, this project will not know. There's a new alias being written, a new pointer, if you will, to the location of this media file. As you start importing media into your Premiere Pro projects, it's important to keep that media organized. So what I'd like to do in this video is review some of the things that you can do to stay organized. You'll notice I'm working in a new project called Organize. You can go ahead and create your own project. We're just going to import different pieces of content so we can see what we can do with them. So here I am in the project panel. What I want to do is import some media. Go ahead and double click in this empty space to open up the import dialog box. Here in the fundamentals directory I have the audio folder. I also have the images folder and I also have the video folder. So I have a couple different options here. I certainly could import piece by piece through this dialog box, but because I want some video and some images and some audio, the best bet really is to come over to the media browser. I'm going to go ahead and press the tilde key to go into a full screen view. Then I'm going to expand my local drive. I'm going to go into the appropriate user account and on the desktop I have that fundamentals directory. So at this point I can click on the video folder and I can see all the different video files that are available. Again, you can scroll through these as well. Depending upon the speed of your hard drive would ultimately 
dictate how quickly these thumbnails load in. You can also change the size of the thumbnails, by the way. You can increase or decrease them using this slider. Nevertheless, what I'm going to do is select a couple different clips here. So I'm going to select this clip. I'm going to hold down the Shift key and select this clip so I can select this range. Then holding down the Command key, I'm going to select these clips. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and right click or control click and I'll choose Import. All that media will be imported into the new organized project. I'm going to come over to the Images directory and do something similar. I'm going to select all of these images. I'm not going to select the PSD. I'll right click or control click and I'll choose Import again. Then I'll come over to the Audio directory. There's an MP3 file that I want. I'll go ahead and right click or control click on that and I'll choose Import. I'm going to go ahead and press the tilde key again to go back to the original view. Then we want to come over to the project panel. And you'll notice we have all sorts of media here now. And this header up here towards the top gives you a couple different sorting options. Again, if we come into the full screen view with the project panel as the active panel, go ahead and press the tilde key. It'll go into the full screen view. You can use these headers to sort your content. So what's nice about this panel is you're getting a couple different visual indicators in terms of what kind of content these files are. So here this little green box represents that it's an audio file. We also get a little icon here of a waveform that's an indicator that it's an audio file. I also have this media type column visible which is also saying that it's an audio file. Now we turned on this media type header in an earlier movie. Remember all you have to do is right click or control click within the header and choose metadata display. Within this dialog box you have all sorts of customization options but that media type option is in the Premiere Pro project metadata section and here you can just check media type. So I'm going to come over here and cancel out of this. This information makes it very useful to be able to organize your content. Another thing that you may want to do because if you don't know exactly what a video clip represents, these file names aren't all that informative. So you may want to come back to the icon view so you can see a thumbnail and then switch back to the list view. It's kind of tedious. So what you can do is come up to the top corner and from this menu you can choose thumbnails. And when you choose thumbnails you'll notice you get little thumbnails here which make it easier for you to identify what the video clip actually represents. Now if you have a lot more media than what I have now within this panel, you may also want to perform searches based upon words, file types, whatever the case may be. For example, I have a couple different images called bones. If I go ahead and type in bones, you'll notice I see those still images appear. To clear that field, simply click this X. So now what we want to do is we want to create some new bins and place this media within the appropriate bin that we create. So how do you create a new bin? Well there's a variety of different ways of course. You can come down here towards the bottom of the panel. You'll see a little folder. You can click that to create a new bin. You can also come up to the file menu and from the file menu you can choose new and you'll notice that there's a bin option there as well. Command B or Control B would be the keyboard shortcut. So if we create a new bin, I can go ahead and call this images and then I can select all of the images within the project panel and simply drag them into that bin. At that point you'd have the ability to collapse the images folder. So that's all you have to do is create these bins. And like I said, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can use the keyboard shortcut, Command B or Control B. I'll go ahead and call this video and then I'll select all the video clips and place them within that bin. You can further refine this by placing bins within bins. So if you wanted to, you could create a bones bin within the images folder. Notice the images bin is selected. You can come down here and click new bin and that bin is automatically nested within the images bin. I can go ahead and rename this bones and then drag these two bones images into that bin. So you have a lot of control in terms of how you can go about structuring your media. But it is important. You want to make sure that you stay organized inside your projects. Ultimately, it's just going to make it easier for you to find your content.
Before we move on to the next chapter, I just want to talk about how you can go about reconnecting media that appears offline or how you can relink your media. Now, a common scenario is that you have your media on an external hard drive and for whatever reason you forget to plug your external hard drive in before you open Premiere. Well, Premiere will look for your media on that drive and once it can't find it, it will tell you that that media is offline and it's up to you to redirect Premiere to the media's location. Another common workflow is you'll use low resolution footage within Premiere to create your sequence, but once you're ready to export, you want to relink it to the high resolution versions of that footage. So whatever the case may be, in this video, we're going to talk about how you can relink media. So I moved the media that was associated with this draw project. And because I did that, Premiere won't be able to find it. So if I go ahead and open this project, you'll notice I get this dialog box. This dialog box is fairly powerful. You'll notice down here towards the bottom, you have some options in terms of what Premiere will do when it looks for the footage. In this case, we're going to match the file name and the file extension. There are reasons not to match the file extension. For example, if you do have high resolution versions of your footage, maybe it's an MP4 file instead of an MOV file. If that's the case, you wouldn't want this option selected. Over on the right, you want to make sure that align time code is selected. If you're working with a sequence, you want to make sure that everything matches up properly. You do want to relink others automatically, and what that means is if Premiere finds one piece of footage, and then based upon that location of that footage, it finds all the other footage, it will automatically relink all of it for you. So it's a real time saver. The other thing that you want to do, probably, is use the media browser to locate the files. This gives you the ability to access that hover scrub feature, so you can really look at the video clips and understand what the content is within that video clip. So you have a couple options here. You can choose Offline All, which is telling Premiere Pro that you know they're offline and to stop bugging you about it. Or you can come in and select individual files and mark them as offline. You can click Cancel, which will bring you into Premiere. And once you're in Premiere, all your footage will be marked as offline. The other thing that you can do is you can locate right from this dialog box. If you click Locate, you'll notice it opens up the media browser you then have the ability to start looking through your file system for the footage. Now in this case, I placed all the footage in this media folder on the desktop. Now what's nice about this dialog box is you can actually go up pretty far in this file structure. Meaning, if you come up to the desktop, you can then come over and click search. And what Premiere will do is search, in this case, bones.png, because that's what we had selected in the link media dialog box. And because this file exists within this media folder, it will find it. So you can go up as high as you want. Just know if you go all the way up to the hard drive level and you have a large hard drive, it's going to take a lot of time. But in this case, if I just come over to the media folder, I can then come over and click search. Once I click search, you'll notice it finds that file. If you select that file and click OK, once you click OK, you'll notice it links that media for you. Now again, what we want to do is link all of the media. So in this case, what I want to do is make sure that this particular file is selected, this MP3 file. I'll come over and click Locate again. Then I'll come back to the desktop level. And once I click the desktop level, I'll click Search again and it's going to find that mp3. I can come over and click OK, and you'll notice that all the media now has been reconnected. Now, that's how you can reconnect your media when you open up your project. But what happens if you open up your project and you see that media is offline? How can you reconnect it? Well, let's take a look at that. So what I'm going to do is close out of this project, and I'm not going to save any changes, so I can reopen that project in Premiere without linking it. So you can see what it looks like once the project opens in the application. So I'll choose Draw. In this case, it's not going to be able to find the media. I'm going to go ahead and click Cancel. Once I click Cancel, you'll notice that all the footage is offline. So you have a couple different options here. You can come in and select an individual file, for example, and right-click or Control-click on it. And in the contextual menu, you can choose Link Media. 
And when you do that, you have this same dialog box. So what we want to do is come over and locate this. Again, it's showing you the original path. Sometimes the original path gives you some type of clue in terms of where you should be looking. But I do want to come up to the desktop and into this media folder, and then I'll come into the video folder, and then I'll click search, and it will find that file, and then I can come over and click OK. Once I click OK, you'll notice it's now online. So you could do this on a file by file basis. You can come over and reconnect the entire bin by choosing link media. Or what I really like is you can select the sequence. And in this case, you can see that we have quite a bit of footage offline here within the sequence. We can go ahead and right click or control click on the sequence. And then we can choose link media. We can see all the media that's missing. Again, we can come over and click locate. You want to make sure that relink others automatically is selected. We do want to come back to the desktop, more specifically the media folder. Then you can click search and then you can click OK and you'll notice it relinks everything within that sequence. So if you ever have footage offline or if you want to reconnect it to a different piece of footage, that's how you would approach it. You would simply select either the sequence, the bin, the file and choose link media. Or if you open up a project and you get the link media dialog box right out of the gate, you can go ahead and link your media before you even enter Premiere so you would never see it offline. Now that you have a solid understanding of the Premiere Pro interface and you understand how to import media, what we want to take a look at is how we can analyze our video clips and mark them with in and out points. So the first thing that I'd like you to do is open up that fundamentals folder that we've been working with and just select all the projects that we've created so far and get rid of them. We don't need them. We'll go ahead and create a new project. So to create a new project here from the welcome screen, click the new project link under the create new section. In terms of this dialog box, it doesn't really matter. You do want the location to be in that fundamentals folder. And we're just going to go ahead and call this project learning to draw. And in terms of the options, again, it's not overly important to get them right right now. We can always come back to these settings and make modifications. My recommendation would be, however, to come over and select the GPU acceleration if you have it as an option. At that point, you can come down here and click OK. Once you click OK, what we want to do is import some media. So let's come up to the file menu. From the file menu, you can choose import, command I or control I. This will open up the import dialog box. What I'd like you to do is find the media folder that you downloaded from our site and select video, images, and audio, all three folders, and click import. Now there are some PSD files in there. For our purposes right now, we'll leave this import as set to merge all layers, and then you can click OK. And you should have three bins, audio, images, and video. What we want to review right now is how we can mark in and out points for a video clip. So go ahead and expand the video bin. It doesn't really matter what clip you double click, but go ahead and double click a clip to load it into the source monitor. What we want to do in this video is learn how we can navigate using the source monitor through a series of keyboard shortcuts and also how we can mark in and out points. Most of the times when you have footage, you're not going to use the entire clip. What you're going to do is use a portion of that clip. Now, in order for you to use a portion of the clip, you can mark an in point, which would be the new beginning of the clip, and the out point, which would be the new end of the clip, so to speak. So, like I said, we could use these controls down here towards the bottom. We can play and stop the video footage using this as a toggle. We can also use the space bar as a keyboard shortcut and use that as a toggle. And if you hover over any one of these buttons, you can see the tooltip will tell you what that particular button does. So if you want to step forward one frame, you can click that button. Realistically, you're going to be using J, K, and L, those three keys, to navigate the source monitor. To be honest with you, this footage, there's very little variation within it. So it's not really a good example to use here. It's hard to see one second from another second it pretty much looks the same throughout. So I'm going to scroll down here towards the bottom a little bit and double click one of these clips where we actually have some 
drawing taking place and there's a lot more movement and you can see what's happening. So I'm just scrubbing this playhead. But if we want, what we can do is control that playhead using the keyboard shortcuts I was telling you about. We have J, K, and L. Those are the main navigators that we're going to be using. You can use the spacebar, again, to play and pause. And you can also use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move forwards and backwards on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. But for now, what I want to do is look at J, K, and L. So L will move the playhead forward. And if you press L more than once, you'll notice you increase the speed in which the playhead is playing. K pauses the video. J goes backwards. And again, if you press J more than once, you'll increase the speed of the playhead. So J, K, and L, I can't stress that enough in terms of how important they are. We have a couple other options. If you hold down K and then press the L key on your keyboard and hold down the L key, you'll move the playhead in slow motion. Forwards, of course. If you hold down the K key and the J key, you'll move the playhead backwards in slow motion. If you want to move frame by frame, you can just use the arrow keys on the keyboard. But if you're stuck in this workflow of using J, K, and L, the other option is to hold down K and simply tap L on your keyboard to move forward one frame at a time. The opposite would be true if you hold down K and press the J key, you'll move backwards one frame at a time. So those are some important keyboard shortcuts you should be aware of. The next thing that you want to do is probably mark in and out points. The in point would represent the part of the clip that you want, and then the out point would represent the ending of the clip that you want, or the footage within the clip that you want. So what we're going to do is press L on the keyboard, and we're going to watch this footage. Now, you probably have to watch it once or twice to even know what the footage represents, but as we look at this video, we can see that the person is drawing the hand. And so around here, it stops, and this is really just filler video. Maybe the cameraman didn't turn off the camera, whatever the case may be. We now have a better idea as to what the footage is. So I'm going to move the playhead back to the beginning, and I'm going to mark an in point with the I key on the keyboard and an out point with the O key on the keyboard. So here we go. We're going to go ahead and press L on the keyboard. I think I want it from here, so I'll press I. You can see that the video has been marked. And once the drawing stops, I'm going to press the O key on the keyboard. I think that looks good. So I've marked the in and out points. I'm going to press K to pause this. Now probably what you want to do is view this clip now based upon the markers that you set up. So we want to play the video clip based upon our in point and out point. And you can do that by holding down the Option key on the Mac, Alt on Windows, and then press the K key on the keyboard, and you'll play the video clip based upon your in point and your out point. And so right now, I think this looks pretty good. You could come in and make modifications, and you can refine it. But for right now, like I said, I think it looks good. But there you go. That's how you can navigate video clips within the source monitor. And that's also how you can mark in and out points. In the last video, we looked at how we could mark in and out points with our clips in the source monitor. Well, there's another way that you can do this directly in the project panel. So right now I have the source monitor active because I see this highlight around it. You want to make sure that the project panel has focus. And once it does, you can press the tilde key to go into a full screen view. At this point, down here towards the bottom, you can click on this little icon to switch to icon view. Then you can hold down the command key on the Mac, control on Windows, and double click the video bin to enter that folder. And in this case, I'm going to increase the magnification of each of these clips. Now after doing that, remember what you can do is hover scrub. And if you hover scrub, you get a preview of what the video clip is all about. Now if you click on it, you'll notice you get a little timeline with a little playhead that you can scrub back and forth. So that's great. But the other thing that you can do is you can control that playhead using the J, K, and L keys, just like you could in the source monitor. So if you want to move forward, you can press the L key. If you want to pause, you can press the K key. And if you want to go backwards, you can press the J key. I'll go ahead and press K again. If you press L, 
and then press L again. Notice you're increasing the speed. All the functionality that you would expect within the source monitor is essentially available right here within the project panel. So if we want to mark an in and out point, we can do that as well. I'll press J to go back a little bit. In fact, I'll press it again so I increase the speed of that. Once I get to where I think should be the, the beginning, I'll press the K key to pause the video. And then what I want to do is mark those in and out points. So let's just say I'm happy with this and I want this to be the in point. I'll press I on the keyboard. You'll notice that the space before the little playhead is no longer blue. If I press L, I'll see it play through. And I'll press L again to make this go a little bit faster. And I'm pretty sure I want the end point to be somewhere around here. I'll press K to pause it. L again to go forward at normal speed. Then I'll press O on the keyboard to mark the out point. So here you can mark in and out points within the project panel, much like you can within the source monitor. In the last video, we looked at how we could mark in and out points for a particular video clip. Now, you're going to run into a situation where you have a clip that contains footage in different sections that you're going to want to use, and you don't have the ability to set up multiple in and out points. Let's take a look at this clip as an example. It's MVI4049. It's inside the video bin. If you go ahead and double click it to load it into the source monitor, you'll see the first part of the video has one angle of the artist drawing her hand. Then the camera is reset to pick up a different angle. So you probably want these two different sections of this one video clip. So what do you do? Well, you create something called a subclip. I'm going to move the playhead back to the beginning, actually right around here where she starts drawing. I'm going to go ahead and press the I key on the keyboard. And if you want, you can press the L key a couple times so this can play through. And find the spot where you want to mark the out point. So I'm going to let this play through a little bit longer. Then I'll press the K key on the keyboard once I think I want to set the out point. So I think right there is where I want to set the out point. So I'm going to press O on the keyboard. Now, like I said, I do want the content down here towards the end of the clip. But what we want to do first is create a subclip of our marked area. To do that, we can come up to the clip menu. Under the clip menu, you can choose Make Subclip, Command U or Control U would be the keyboard shortcut. You can name this in any way that you want to. I'm going to go ahead and call it 4049 Subclip 1. That makes sense to me. You want to make sure that it makes sense to you. I'm going to call it Subclip 1. Notice you have an option here to restrict the trims to the subclip boundaries. What that means is once you get this subclip into a sequence, if you don't restrict the trims, that means you'll have the ability to get the video data to the right of the out point and to the left of the in point. So you can basically reset your in and out point. And this can be useful if you want to apply a transition effect and need a little bit more footage than what you thought. There are several different reasons as to why you may want to introduce this handle area. That's what it's referred to. If you know for a fact that you don't want access to that information, then you can restrict it. But to be honest with you, the way I work, I typically don't restrict the trims. But again, it's a personal preference. Go ahead and find what works best for you. In different situations, call for different things. So it's really a personal preference. I'm going to come over and click OK. Once you click OK, you can see that we have a subclip. And you'll notice that the icon looks a little bit different. It's basically the same icon with what looks like an in marker and an out marker. Now, because we have this subclip, we're at the liberty to set new in and out points with the original source. So I'm going to go ahead and press the L key on the keyboard to move this footage. I'm going to wait until the camera's placed. And once it's placed, I'll press the K key on the keyboard to pause the playhead. So I'm getting close. I'll go ahead and press L again. And it looks like the camera is <laughs> just about set here. Looks like the cameraman is still trying to focus. Looks like focus has been achieved. I'll press K. I'm going to go ahead and press I to set the new endpoint. I'll press L a couple times to move through this. 
And at this point, I'll go ahead and press O to mark the next out point. Now what we can do is create another subclip. So we can come up to the clip menu and under the clip menu, we can choose make subclip. I'm gonna go ahead and name it the same way, which is the 4049 and I'm gonna call it subclip 002. And then I'll go ahead and click OK. So that's how you create subclips based upon the in and out points that you mark within the source monitor. In the previous chapter, we talked quite a bit about creating new sequences inside of Premiere. What we need to do now, obviously, is create a new sequence. So I just want to quickly review your options. The first option is to come up to the file menu and from there you can choose new and then you can select sequence. Command N or Control N is the keyboard shortcut. Now this will open up the new sequence dialog box and you have a couple different options. You can choose from one of the presets here on the left hand side. Or if you want a little bit more control over one of those presets, you can come over to the settings tab and really kind of configure the sequence to whatever your needs are. Now the downside to this is you do need intimate knowledge of your footage. And if you don't have that knowledge, it makes it difficult to set up the sequence properly. Fortunately, Premiere does all the heavy lifting for you. If you take one of your clips and you drag it over to the timeline, it will create a new sequence for you and the sequence settings will automatically match that of the footage. What's important, however, is the first clip that you drag into the timeline should be fairly representative of the media that you're going to be working with throughout the sequence. You want your sequence settings to match the majority of your media. So if you have some legacy standard definition video that you're going to use within all of your other media, you don't want that to be the first clip that you drag into the sequence. So hopefully that makes sense. In this case, we want the two sub clips that we created from the previous video. So I'm going to highlight this first sub clip. Then I'm going to hold down the shift key and click on the second one to select both of those clips. You'll notice there's an indicator up here. It reads two of 23 items selected. Now these items are side by side. So the shift key works nicely. But if the clips were away from one another, you'd have to hold down the command key on the Mac, control on Windows, and then click on that clip. So with both of these clips selected, what you can now do, instead of dragging over to the timeline, you can also click and drag down here and place them on top of this new item button. And when you let go of the mouse, you'll notice a new sequence is created. Both of your sub clips are in that sequence. And of course, your sequence settings match that of those clips. And again, if you ever have the need to modify the sequence settings, all you have to do is come up to the sequence menu and choose sequence settings and you'll get this dialog box giving you the ability to control any aspect of your sequence. So we have the sequence set up now. We're ready to take a look at some other techniques we can use while editing. At this point, we want to add additional clips to our sequence by using the insert edit technique. If we take a look at the sequence, we can see that the sequence name matches that of the first clip that we dragged into the sequence. So we should probably update that. Inside the project panel, go ahead and find the sequence. It's easy to find because the icon is different, the label color is different, and also the media type clearly is different. But go ahead and double click it to get a blinking cursor and update the name to read gesture. And the reason why we're calling it gesture is because this particular sequence will be a video about gesture drawings. So go ahead and press return or enter. You probably want to move this outside of the video bin. If you want to, as long as the project panel has focus and you know that it does because it's highlighted, press the tilde key on your keyboard to enter a full screen view, then grab the sequence and drag it down here towards the bottom where there's no content. It's a little narrow space here, but you'll see the little no sign go away from the hand cursor. Once you let go of the mouse, it's now outside of that video bin. So that's great. And you can press the tilde key again to go back to the original view. So like I said, what we want to do is we want to use the insert edit technique to add clips to this sequence. If you expand the video bin, you'll notice I've already created some additional sub clips based upon videos 4046 all the way down to 4050. So you can come into those clips here. Just go ahead and double click them to load them into the source monitor and add your own in and out points based upon where you think they should be. 
really doesn't matter. But like I said, we want to add these to the sequence. If we take a look at the timeline, and it's important obviously to click here to add focus to the timeline now, you can easily navigate and change the view of the timeline by using some keyboard shortcuts. The backslash key, for example, will make all of your clips fit within the workable space. We also can navigate from edit to edit using the up and down arrow keys. If you use the down arrow key, you'll move to the previous edit. You can also use the end key on your keyboard if you have one to move to the end of the sequence. If you prefer dragging, you can hold down the shift key and as you drag, it will snap almost like a magnet to those edit points. So that's helpful to know how you can navigate through the timeline. What we want to do is take a look at some of these subclips. So I'm going to go ahead and double click 4046. And what this is, is just a video of some gesture drawings. Now this really should go before the first two subclips that we created and added to the timeline. So what we want to do is move the playhead back to frame one. Now we can do that by using the arrow keys on the keyboard. Again, it's important to have focus on the timeline. I'm going to go ahead and press the up arrow key so the playhead is at the very beginning of the sequence. And like I said, what we want to do is insert this clip. Now we can do that by clicking this button right here, or better yet, using the comma key on the keyboard. And if we take a look at the sequence now, we can see that that clip is in front of the subclips we added in the sequence in the previous video. So that's great. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next subclip, which is 4047. So here we can see the artist starting to draw out some of these gestures. I think this should go right after the clip we inserted. So we don't really have much in the way of navigating the timeline, but if you do, make sure you click to add focus to the timeline so you can use those arrow keys. But once you're happy with the position of the playhead, press the comma key on your keyboard to insert that clip. And now, if we move the playhead back to the beginning, we can see those two clips were successfully added to the sequence. So that's really all there is to it. The insert edit technique allows you to insert clips into your sequence based upon the position of the playhead. When you're editing a sequence, chances are you're going to want to move some of your clips around within the sequence. And what I'd like to do is show you some different techniques that are available to you as you try to make these changes. The first thing that I want to do is I want to add some audio tracks to this sequence to give you an idea as to the audio that we're going to be working with and what we're going to try to sync up. Now, you'll find that the audio files that we're gonna be working with are quite a bit shorter than the video files. So we have to get somewhat creative in terms of how we're going to edit this piece together. Let's go ahead and open up the audio bin. Inside the audio bin, if we scroll down a little bit, you'll find that there's an audio file called Practicing Anatomy, the hand. This is a voiceover that we're gonna use. And what I'd like you to do is drag this into the sequence. And you can see it's quite a bit shorter than our video files. Now we also want some background audio to play. You'll notice inside the audio bin we have another audio file called Teller of the Tales. It's an MP3 file. Go ahead and drag that into the sequence and it too is shorter than the video. Let's not be overly concerned with this right now, but what I'd like to show you is how you can move your clips if you find that you have to as you're editing a sequence. Now the first thing that you'll probably do if you want to move a clip is to simply click and drag it. But as you do this, you really don't have a ton of precision. If you want this to essentially be in place of this clip, once you let go of the mouse, you'll notice you're really kind of cutting off that other clip. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that, Command Z or Control Z on Windows. What you wanna do is you wanna swap these clips. So in order for you to be able to perform a swap, you have to hold down some modifier keys on the keyboard. Here on the Mac, you're gonna hold down the Command key and the Option key. If you're on the Windows side, it would be Control Option. When you do that, you'll get an interesting icon for your cursor. The icon is basically showing you you're about to swap clips. So if you click and drag this, as you place this at the first edit point, you'll kind of feel it snap in place, hopefully. I'm gonna go ahead and bring this back here for a second. It's really important to come over here and select this option, which is Snap. 
The option is selected if it's blue. If it's gray, it means it's not selected. So in this case, you'll notice it's gray. I'll click it so it turns blue again. Snapping gives you the ability to snap to these edit points. It also gives you the ability to snap to the playhead. In this case, you want the precision of the snap. Sometimes you don't, but in this case we do. So it really is helpful to have this option selected. So again, hold down those modifier keys, which is Command Option on the Mac, Control Alt on Windows. Click and drag this. Now, once you place this on that edit point, it will snap into place. If you take a look at your program monitor, you'll see essentially the first two frames of the two clips. When you let go of the mouse, you can see that those clips have been swapped. So that's really the best way of doing that. Otherwise, you're going to have to move this one out of the way, and then you're going to have to place this in the correct location, and it's somewhat of a hassle. So the swap is really handy. So I'm going to go ahead and undo that, Command-Z or Control-Z on Windows, because I do like the sequence of the clips. One thing that I do want to do, however, is move these clips down in time within the sequence. Now, we can do that by moving this playhead. And I'm going to place the playhead right around here, around the one minute mark, a little bit before the one minute mark. So I'm at 55 seconds. We can always tweak this a little bit later on, but I just want to show you that you can move everything and snap it to the playhead if you have this snap option selected. So I'm going to click and drag a marquee around everything here. Then if you click and drag to the right, you'll notice it snaps into place the beginning section of all those clips and audio files snap to that playhead when you let go of the mouse. You can see that you easily moved all of these clips down in time. So that should give you a good understanding as to how you can rearrange and move your clips within a sequence. Something that you can do inside of Premiere is mark points within the timeline so you can insert your content into very specific locations. Let me show you what I mean. In the sequence right now, if we just scrub the playhead, we can see that this last subclip that we've added to the timeline ends with the artist drawing the hand in this fashion. As we can see over here in the source monitor, we're a little bit further down the path in the drawing. We have a lot more shading going on, so on and so forth. What I want to do is insert this down here towards the end of the sequence, which means your playhead needs to be at the end of the sequence. Now, if you press the down arrow key on the keyboard, that will happen. But if you decide to scrub the playhead just to look at the video one more time before you make your insert, if I come over here and leave the playhead at this location, and then I come over and click the insert button, comma is the keyboard shortcut, look what happens. It gets inserted right where the playhead is. So this can be a problem if your playhead isn't in the correct location. So again, if we press the down arrow key on the keyboard, what we can do is mark our sequence. So it's really important to have focus on the timeline so you see the border around this panel. Then press the I key on the keyboard to place an endpoint once you have that endpoint, it doesn't matter where the playhead is within the sequence. If you insert this clip that's loaded in the source monitor by pressing the comma key on the keyboard, you'll notice that that clip is now placed based upon the endpoint that was set within the sequence. So hopefully that gives you some ideas in terms of how you can have a little bit more control over where clips are placed within the sequence when you perform insert edits. It's really easy to trim clips within the timeline. Now remember, when I created the subclips, I created them of the non-restricted variety, meaning that we have those video handles on either side of the clip. Now we can access that video information by performing trims within the sequence. Let me show you what I mean. If you hover over the end of a clip, you'll get an arrow that points to the left or to the right. And here, you can either remove some of that video data, or you can add some of the video data if the arrow is pointing the other way. If you click and drag, you can add some more video information. And that's all there is to it. So you can come in here and refine these clips by dragging the end of the clip here within the sequence. And of course, the arrow 
is a good indicator in terms of which way you're going to go. If you want to extend the time, click and drag with the arrow pointing out away from the clip. If you want to reduce the time, make sure that the arrow is pointing in towards the clip. Just a couple other things that you should be aware of. If you want to zoom into the timeline, you can use the plus key on your keyboard. And you can zoom out by using the minus key on your keyboard. If you zoom in quite a bit, if you want to see everything within the sequence, you can use the backslash key on the keyboard. So those are a couple keyboard shortcuts that are pretty handy when it comes to navigating and zooming into the timeline. I also want to point out that there are some additional views. For example, if you place your cursor in between these different video tracks, you'll get a two-way arrow. If you click and drag up, you'll increase the amount of space that you see. And the same goes for the audio tracks. I'll click and drag down, and I'm expanding the height of it. Now, if we come up to the top corner, we can control this further. For example, we have video head thumbnails, meaning the head of the video you'll see a thumbnail. You can also do video head and tail thumbnails, which means you'll see thumbnails at the beginning and the end of the clip. Or you can choose continuous video thumbnails, so you always see a thumbnail throughout the duration of the clip here inside the sequence. So again, just some additional view options so you're aware of them. I'll go ahead and restore this back to the default view for now. At this point, you have a pretty good understanding as to how you can add media to your sequence. There's one final thing that I want to talk about in the next video, and that's how you can just get rid of content that you don't think you're going to need within a particular clip. And we'll do that by using this tool right here, which is the razor tool, and we'll do that in the next video. When you're editing a sequence inside of Premiere, you may find that marking an in and out point or even trimming clips within the sequence is a little bit more tedious than it needs to be. For example, you may find a section of a clip that you just don't need. In those situations, it may make sense to cut that portion of the clip off and remove it altogether. Now you can do that by using the razor tool, and that's available here inside the tools panel. C is the keyboard shortcut, C obviously for cutting. With this tool selected, I highly recommend coming over and choosing the snap option. And what you probably want to do is move your playhead to the point in which you want to cut the clip. Once you get it positioned properly, at that point all you have to do is move your razor cursor in the area of the playhead and when you click your mouse, it will cut exactly where the playhead is. I'm going to go ahead and move the playhead down here a little bit. I don't want that section of the video. And now I'm ready to make another cut, so I'm going to click right here next to the playhead. And now I've isolated a section of that clip, and I can select it with the selection tool. V is the keyboard shortcut. With it selected, you have a couple different options. The first option is to perform a lift edit. To perform a lift edit, you'll press the delete or backspace key on your keyboard and you'll notice that that section of the clip has been lifted out of the sequence. Now, in some situations, you may want not only to get rid of the clip, but to move the rest of the clip downstream so it joins with this first section of the clip. If that's the case, you want to perform a ripple delete. I'm going to go ahead and undo what I just did there, Command-Z or Control-Z on Windows, to bring that section of the clip back. To perform a ripple delete, select that section of the clip that you don't want. Then you can right-click or Control-Click, and in the contextual menu, you can choose Ripple Delete. When you do that, not only will the clip be lifted from the sequence and removed, but the remaining clips will move to take place of that old clip. I'll go ahead and do that and you can see that that's the case. So those are some other options for you when you're editing your sequences inside of Premiere. In the last chapter, we spent quite a bit of time looking at some basic editing techniques to get you started inside of Premiere. In this chapter, I want to focus on some techniques that more experienced editors seem to use. I want to start talking about how you can work with locking your tracks, targeting your tracks, 
and also talking about something called sync lock. Ultimately, these features can make you more productive inside the program when used properly. Now, I'm working with the same sequence that we were working with in the last chapter. The only difference is, you'll notice, I've placed a clip here at the beginning of the sequence, and this clip is located inside your video bin. If you expand your video bin all the way down towards the bottom, or close to the bottom, you should find a clip called mvi4055.mp4, which is a movie because it contains both audio and video. Like I said, that's at the beginning of the sequence. What I want to focus on are these columns right here. On the far left, we have something called the source indicator. This is used for source patching, which is something we'll talk about in the next video. But to the right of that, you'll see a little padlock icon. This gives you the ability to lock a track. To the right of that, you'll see something called a track target. And to the right of that, you'll see a sync lock icon. These are the features that we want to review. So what's the purpose of targeting a track? Well, there's a couple, one of which is to navigate your sequence. If you select one of these tracks, it becomes highlighted in blue, which is an indicator that you're targeting that particular track. We only have one video track, so it would be used by default anyway. But if you do target a particular video track and then use the arrow keys on your keyboard to navigate the sequence, for example, if I press the down arrow key on the keyboard, you'll notice I'm moving to the different edit points within the sequence. And that's based upon the track that I'm targeting. Which means if I come down here and select audio track two and deselect video track one, and then use the up arrow key to move backwards, you'll notice I'm moving to the edit points within the audio two track layer. So that's one reason why you may want to target a particular track. The other is when you're pasting content. You'll notice right now I have this first clip selected in the sequence. I'm going to go ahead and copy it to the clipboard. Command C on the Mac, Control C on Windows. I'm going to deselect the Audio 2 track. If you move your time indicator to a specific area within the sequence, and then you perform a normal paste, Command V or Control V, you'll notice that the content just appears on top of what was already there. It's not a very controlled way to paste your media. And quite frankly, it doesn't really work. If I play this a little bit, all of a sudden, the clip changes and it has new audio and we lose the voiceover. So that's not really what we want to do. I'm going to go ahead and undo that, Command Z or Control Z on Windows. If you wanted that video clip to appear, but you wanted the audio to be maintained, well, that's when you start targeting specific tracks. For example, we want the video track to appear on the V2 track, and we would want the audio track to appear on the A3 track. So we can come over and select those tracks within the track target column, and then we can perform our paste, which is Command V or Control V on Windows. And you'll notice that that content is pasted exactly where we want it to be pasted without overwriting anything. So that's great. But again, I'm going to go ahead and undo that. Command Z or Control Z on Windows. I'm going to deselect those tracks that I targeted. You can also perform a paste insert. If you remember from the last chapter, if you perform an insert edit, basically what you're going to do is cut everything at the time indicator and push it over to make room for the new clip. You can do that when pasting. All you have to do is come up to the edit menu. And from the edit menu, you can choose paste insert. When you do that, you'll notice that everything is moved over. The new content is placed in the new open space. But again, we're cutting the audio here. So we don't really want to do that. I'll go ahead and undo that. Command Z or Control Z on Windows. And what we can do is target specific tracks again. So V2 and A3. And then we can come up to the edit menu. And from there, we can choose paste insert. And now we're getting the desired results, except again, we're now cutting the audio, and I don't want to cut the audio. I'm fine with cutting the video, but the audio, I kind of want to play through continuously. So again, I'm going to undo that. How do we handle this situation? Well, you could lock the audio layers. The problem with locking a particular layer or track is you're locking it down. You can't do anything. You can't apply effects. You can't move it. 
It's essentially rendered useless. You can't do anything. But we will get the effect that we're looking for if we do come up to the edit menu and choose paste insert. You'll notice that those two audio tracks are preserved. They're not cut. Again, I'm going to go ahead and undo that. And then I'm going to unlock those two tracks. A better approach, of course, would be to come over here and deselect toggle sync lock. Basically, what toggle sync lock does is it allows you to sync all of your clips based upon their current positions in the sequence. If you deselect that, Premiere will no longer be concerned about synchronization and will allow these two tracks to stay put. So now if we come up to the edit menu and from there we choose paste insert, we're getting the desired results where we're just adding the audio without harming the other two audio tracks. So hopefully these columns are beginning to make a little bit more sense and you can begin to see how you would use them in real world situations, giving you more control over where your content appears within the sequence. In the last chapter, we looked at how we could perform insert edits, and they're fairly straightforward. You essentially take a clip and you insert it into the sequence. If there's any content in the way inside that sequence, that content will be cut, pushed out of the way, making room for the new clip. We're going to focus on an overwrite edit in this video, which is very similar, but the key difference is if there's any content in the way, instead of it getting pushed out of the way, it simply gets overwritten. So you lose what's in the way of the clip that you're trying to place within the sequence. Hopefully that makes sense, but let's take a quick look at exactly how it works. I'm going to come up to the file menu and from the file menu, I'm going to choose new and then I'm going to choose sequence. This will open up the new sequence dialog box. In terms of the preset, it doesn't really matter. Remember, Premiere can reconfigure the sequence settings when we drop our first clip into the sequence. So I'm just going to come over here and click OK. Once I click OK, the new sequence is created. What I'd like you to do is expand the video bin. And inside the video bin, we have a video clip named MVI4048. If you double click it, you can see inside the source monitor, we have a close up of this artist sketching out her hand. Now, the clip just above it, which is 4047, is a wide shot version of the same drawing. So what I'd like to do is have this video playing, then I want to quickly cut to the close up, and then I want to come back to the wide shot. So I'm going to go ahead and take MVI 4047, I'm going to drag it into the sequence. You'll notice that this particular clip doesn't contain any audio. We get that mismatch warning, which is perfect. What we want to do is change the sequence settings. At this point, we want to move the time indicator down here a little bit, and I'd like to cut to that close up around here. We have a couple different options. We can leave the time indicator here, but if we know we want this exact spot, we can press the I key on the keyboard to mark an endpoint within this sequence. That way, the time indicator is irrelevant. It doesn't really matter where it is. Then we want to come over and load 4048 back into the source monitor. You can do that by double clicking or you can come up here and choose that video from the menu. You'll notice that we already have in and out points set up for this particular clip. And I think I'm happy with those in and out points. If you're not, right click in this area and in the contextual menu, you can choose clear in and out points and you can set new in and out points. But like I said, I'm happy with this. So what we want to do is perform an overwrite edit. Remember, we've already performed an insert. And if I click insert, let's take a look at what happens. We essentially split the existing clip, move it out of the way, and place the new content here. That's not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to go ahead and undo that, Command-Z or Control-Z. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform an overwrite edit, which means this area here where we marked the in and out point will overwrite this clip here within the sequence based upon this endpoint. So if we come over here and click overwrite, period is the keyboard shortcut. You'll notice that in marker is where the new clip is positioned. And we simply got rid of the video that was there and replaced it with this new clip. So if we watch this now, here's the artist drawing her hand. We have this wider angle shot. It cuts to the close up. 
And then after the close-up plays for a little bit, it cuts back to the wide shot. Now, timing-wise, it may be a little bit off, but that's how the edit is performed. Now, through all this, when we perform insert edits and overwrite edits, there's something that I haven't mentioned until now, and that's this source indicator. This is a hugely important component when performing these types of edits. This source indicator essentially determines how the source patching will take place. In this case, we were performing the patch on the video one track, and that's exactly what the indicator is indicating. If we go ahead and undo our edit, Command-Z or Control-Z on Windows, we can move this. Now, first of all, I want to stress the importance that you need to have a source indicator selected in order for one of those edits to work. If I click this again, it's now deselected. It's still indicated, but if it's not selected, notice you can't perform an overwrite or an insert edit. It has to be selected. The other thing that you may have noticed is that you won't see anything here if you don't have anything selected within the project panel or if nothing is loaded in the source monitor. Once you select something in the project panel or once you load something into the source monitor, these options become visible. So if we want to target a different track like video track two, we don't target that track by clicking on the track, this technically is track targeting, but this has nothing to do with performing our insert or overwrite edits. What we're doing is performing source patching, and in order for us to do that, we have to use our source indicator to control what video track gets patched. So in this case, if we really want video track two to be patched, we have to click in the source patch indicator to do that. If we go ahead and perform the edit now, you'll notice that the video lands on the video to track. So hopefully that makes sense. Not only can you control this with video, but you can also control it with audio. So I'm gonna go ahead and undo this again, and I'm gonna scroll down and load in this clip, mvi4055.mp4, because it does contain audio. And here you have a couple different options. You can target a particular audio layer, or if you want only the video track, you can grab this guy right here and drag him into the sequence. Now, when you drag into the sequence, it doesn't necessarily snap to a marker that you've placed. In this case, Premiere will let me place it anywhere, not just within the endpoint that I set up. And that's because Premiere figures if you're dragging it, you know where you want to drop it. So I'll go ahead and let go of the mouse and I'll place the clip. I'm going to go ahead and undo that again, Command-Z or Control-Z on Windows. So you can drag just the video or just the audio. But if you want to use these indicators, you can control what track both the video and the audio end up on. So in this case, if we want this to end up on video track 2, we can click in the video track 2 indicator area. And we can do the same thing for the audio. Let's say we want the audio to appear on audio track 3. Now, if we perform an insert or an overwrite, you'll notice that that content appears where we want it to appear. Again, I'll go ahead and undo that. One other thing that I want to show you, if I come over here and target the video one track with this source indicator, you can patch black video or silence if you're working with audio. So for whatever reason, if you wanted just black space here, you can hold down the option key on the Mac Alt on Windows and click on the indicator. You'll see a black box appear around it. If I go ahead and perform an insert or an overwrite edit, in this case, I'll perform an overwrite edit, you'll notice I've just added a black space within the sequence. And that space is determined by the length of this video clip. Now you can do the same thing with audio. I'll go ahead and undo that again by holding down the Option key on the Mac, Alt on Windows. And instead of adding black space, you'll add silence. We don't have any music here. If I wanted to, I could come up to the audio bin and grab a voiceover or even this music and place it here. As long as I'm targeting the audio one track in the source indicator, if you hold down the option key or the alt key on Windows and click, what you'll do is add silence. So if I go ahead and perform an overwrite, period is the keyboard shortcut, I've added black space and silence. So black space for the video track and silence for the audio track. So there you go. I hope that makes sense. But 
The source indicator plays a big role in terms of how you patch content when performing insert and overwrite edits inside of Premiere. If you want a little bit more control when performing your insert and overwrite edits, you may consider using something called three-point editing. In fact, I think we've already used three-point editing without really talking about it, but what we're going to do in this video is review how you can use it effectively. Essentially, it gives you the ability to take a clip and place it within the sequence to a specified duration. So in this case, I'm working with a sequence that contains this video clip. It's MVI 4047. You can find it in your video bin if you want to create a new sequence and follow along. You'll also notice that I have an audio file. It's called tellerofthetales.mp3. It's available inside your audio bin. In this case, I'm going to move the time indicator to the area in which I want the new clip to appear, which is right around here. At that point, you can mark an endpoint by clicking this button or pressing I on your keyboard. Then what we want to do is establish an in and an out point here within the source monitor. So I'm going to go ahead and move the playhead back just a bit, get to the point where you want to mark the end point, which is right here. I'll press I on the keyboard, and I want this to end right about here, so I'll press O. So I want this clip to fit within the sequence, but starting right here. So if we perform an overwrite, again, the keyboard shortcut is period, you'll notice that this clip ends up at the exact end point that we established for this sequence. So we've done that before, and that's great. But I want to show you how it can provide a little bit more control. So I'm going to go ahead and undo that. I'm going to come over here and set an out point. So in this case, I want the out point to be right here. So I'm going to press O on the keyboard. So we're really looking at 2 seconds and 10 frames. In this case, I want to clear the out point. So we can do that by right-clicking or control-clicking and choosing clear out. You can see that this clip right now is 14 seconds in 7 frames. So how can the 14 seconds and 7 frames fit in a space that's 2 seconds and 10 frames? Well, it can't. But what Premiere will do is take the clip from the endpoint and fill the space that we've marked within the sequence. So if I come over here and perform the overwrite, you can see that that's the case. And that's how you can perform 3-point edits. But the opposite is true as well. If you wanted to back time a clip, meaning you know where you want the clip to end, you can do it in reverse, essentially. So I'm going to go ahead and undo that. I still have this in and out point. But what I want to do is mark an out point here, not an in point. So I'm going to go ahead and right click or control click, and I'm going to clear the in. Then what I want to do is decide that the clip needs to end right here where she's done drawing. I'm going to go ahead and press the O key on the keyboard to mark an out point. Then we can perform the insert edit. But actually, before I perform the insert edit, I want to expand this area a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and clear the out point by right-clicking or control-clicking, choosing clear out. And I'm going to come down here just a bit longer, and then I'll press O. So we have a little bit more time here. We have five seconds and 15 frames, but we have a clip that's 35 seconds. But notice that I marked an out point, which means we're going to back time this clip. The out point in the source will match the out point in the program. If we go ahead and perform the overwrite edit, the period key on the keyboard is the keyboard shortcut, you'll notice if I just move the playhead or the time indicator back a little bit here inside the sequence, it ends exactly where we wanted it to end where her hand begins to leave the frame. So that's perfect. So that gives you a lot more control. It's three-point editing. You're working with an in and an out point, either in the program monitor or the source monitor, and an in and an out point in one of the other monitors. But you can only choose three. If you have four, you run into a different situation. Let me show you that quickly. So I'm going to come over here and undo what I just did. And I'm going to come over here and mark an end point by pressing I on the keyboard. So now we have four points. This isn't four-point editing. But if I go ahead and perform an overwrite edit, you get a dialog box. And so here you can ignore the end point or the out point, or you can change the clip speed, which will fit to fill, 
So it will either increase or decrease in speed to fill up this space within the sequence. So that's three-point editing, giving you a little bit more control over your insert and overwrite edits. Even though we have precise editing techniques like three-point editing, you'll still run into situations where you need to make modifications to clips within a sequence. And in order for you to make these modifications or tweaks, there's a couple tools that make the process a little bit more efficient. In this video, we're going to take a look at the ripple edit tool and the rolling edit tool. Now, if you remember from a previous video, we talked about a ripple delete. And hopefully, if you remember how to perform a ripple delete, it'll give you some insight in terms of how the ripple edit tool works. So we have a little bit of a problem here within this sequence. I have two clips side by side. What I'm going to do is zoom into the timeline a little bit by pressing the plus key on the keyboard a couple times. And the problem is that the artist turns and looks at the camera before we cut to the tight shot. I'll go ahead and play this so you can see that that's the case. So clearly we need to make a modification. At this point we know that we can trim the clip. If we trim the clip, we can click and drag to the left to the point in which we want the clip to stop playing, which would be right around here. But that leaves this empty space. Now we need to take a second step by performing a ripple delete. And again, you can do that by right clicking or control clicking in the empty space and choosing ripple delete. So it's a two step process. We can simplify this by using the ripple edit tool. I'll go ahead and undo that. Command Z on the Mac, Control Z on Windows. Instead of just trimming the clip, we're going to come over and choose the ripple edit tool. B is the keyboard shortcut. And you're essentially going to perform the exact same operation, but instead of leaving that empty space, that empty space will automatically be deleted and the adjacent clip will still be joined to this first clip here that we're trimming. So if I click and drag this to the left and I get it to the point in which I'm happy, I'll let go of the mouse and you'll notice that that empty space doesn't exist. It was automatically deleted and now we have a much better cut. So that's the ripple edit tool. I'll go ahead and undo that, Command Z or Control Z on Windows. The other option is to use the rolling edit tool. And the rolling edit tool is different in the sense that it doesn't delete that newly introduced empty space. Instead, what happens is the adjacent clip's handles will fill up that empty space. Remember, a handle is video footage outside of the in and out point. And you can see here in the source monitor, we definitely have footage available before the in point and after the out point. So this will work. What we can do is come over and choose the rolling edit tool. If I perform the same operation by clicking and dragging, again, we're not getting rid of that empty space by deleting it. Instead, that newly introduced empty space is being filled by the handles of the adjacent clip. So if we take a look at this, you can see when we cut to the tight shot, we're at a different point in time. So that only works, however, if the clip has handles. What if it doesn't? You can't use that tool. And let me illustrate that. What I'm going to do is just delete this clip out of the sequence. And over here, I'm going to clear the in and out points. And after doing that, I'm going to go ahead and move the time indicator to the last edit point by pressing the down arrow key on the keyboard. And of course, we want to make sure that we're targeting video track one here when we do that. Once you have the time indicator in the appropriate location, we can go ahead and perform an overwrite. Period is the keyboard shortcut. So now we have the full length of the clip here. If you come over to choose the rolling edit tool and you click and drag to the left, you can't do it. So those two tools, the ripple edit tool and the rolling edit tool, can save you time when tweaking clips within your sequence. As we continue to talk about how we can refine edits that we've made within a sequence, I want to introduce you to two tools. We have the slip tool and the slide tool. And both these tools allow you to tweak and modify clips within a sequence. And it's really useful and really helpful when you have a series of clips stacked up like we have here, and you don't want to modify the overall time of the sequence, and you don't really want to get into trimming clips and performing ripple deletes. So in this case, 
I'm working with this sequence called slide and slip edits, which you can open. I have a situation where the artist is going to bring an eraser to the paper and start erasing by the wrist. But then we cut to a tight shot of her erasing a finger. So what I'd like to do is essentially bring the action of her erasing the finger at about this point because at this point we don't really know where she's going with the eraser. So what you would normally have to do is trim this clip, perform a ripple delete. It's a couple different steps. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see this and I'm going to choose this tool right here which is the slide tool. The slide tool is going to allow me to slide this clip over overwriting the portion of this clip that I don't want and introduce handle of the video adjacent to it on the right hand side. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like and what's great about it is you get a lot of feedback within the program monitor. If you click and drag to the left you'll see that we have two large icons on the bottom. The icon or thumbnail on the left is the last frame of the first clip and the thumbnail is the first frame of the third clip. I'm going to go ahead and undo that for a second. So this is the first clip, this is the second clip, and this would be the third clip. So as we click and drag this, on the left hand side where we see the time code, that's the last frame of the first clip. On the right hand side, that's the first frame of the third clip. So you kind of know what this is going to look like. And so here, we're going to move this so she's just going to pick up the eraser. So right around here. She doesn't quite put it to the paper yet. Then when we let go of the mouse, we've introduced handle over here on the right hand side. But now we have a smoother transition of the eraser coming to the paper, then she's erasing the finger. And again, we could refine that further, but that's essentially what I was looking to do. So we're literally just sliding the video clip over and that's what the slide tool is for. Now we also have the tool above it which is the slip tool and the slip tool makes sense if you think about the predefined areas that we've already established for our clips within the sequence. For example, if we look at this clip right here, we can see that it's nestled in between this clip and this clip but if we play it, we may want to change the in and out point. Well, if we double click this clip, I'll go ahead and press V to highlight the selection tool, we'll load it into the source monitor. If we want to be able to set the in and out point differently from what it is already, we can come over and choose the slip tool. And the slip tool allows you to change the in and out point in line within the sequence that you've already established. And again, we're getting great visual feedback in the program monitor. We're seeing the new in point and the new out point. So now, when we let go of the mouse, that's all we've done. We've just changed the in and out point of that clip in line without affecting the rest of the sequence. So those two tools sometimes are confusing for new users, but you can see how effective they are if you already have a sequence built and you need to make some minor modifications to your clips. If you're going to be performing things like roll edits and ripple edits, you may want to use something called the trim monitor, which will give you additional information visually in terms of how you're going to create that edit. You'll notice I have a sequence open called trim monitor and inside this sequence I have one edit point. If you want to zoom into that edit point, you can press the plus key on your keyboard. And to load the trim monitor, all you have to do is double click that edit point. And you'll notice we see the clip on the left and the clip on the right. Here inside the trim monitor, if you click in between the two clips, you'll set yourself up for a roll edit. And you can perform that roll edit here inside the trim monitor by simply clicking and dragging. Or you can use these controls down here towards the bottom. You can trim backwards one frame or five frames. Or you can go forwards one frame or five frames and you'll notice we have corresponding keyboard shortcuts associated with these buttons. For example, if you want to move one frame backwards, the keyboard shortcut would be option left arrow. It would be option right arrow if you wanted to move forwards. Of course, if you're on the window side, that would be alt and then one of the arrow keys. And if you want to move in five frame increments, you would hold down shift option 
and then one of the arrow keys, that would be Shift Alt in one of the arrow keys on the window side. So you can perform the edit here inside the trim monitor. This of course is a roll edit, but what if you want to perform a ripple edit? If that's the case, what you would do is click either on the left hand side or the right hand side, depending upon which way you want the ripple edit to take place. So what's really nice about this is you can click and drag to create that edit right here, like I said earlier. So I'm just going to back this up a little bit so we still see the artist and you can see that that edit's been performed. And you could do the same thing over here. You could click and drag to the right and you can see that that edit's performed as well. And you can also see how many frames you've moved the clips. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and undo that Command Z or Control Z. There really is a better way to work, believe it or not. I'm going to go ahead and click over here on the left hand side. You can use J, K, and L. Remember, J will move the playhead backwards, L will move the playhead forwards, and K will pause the clip. So if I press J, you'll notice it's moving back, and then I can press K, and there the edit's been performed. And if you want to see what it looks like, press the space bar, and you can see exactly what it looks like. So that looks pretty good. So this trim monitor ultimately gives you a little bit more control over how you perform these edits because it's a better visual representation of what's happening exactly within the sequence. We've really been looking at a lot of different ways that we can perform edits inside of Premiere and especially when it comes to making modifications and tweaks to clips within a sequence. Well, there's a couple more things that I want to show you. And the first thing that I want to show you is something called the replace edit. I think you're going to find these replace edits really useful and really handy. So I'm working with this sequence called replace edits. And if I just drag the time indicator, you can get a sense as to what the sequence is all about. We see some tools that the artist will use. Then we see the artist go into drawing a self portrait. So if we play this in real time from the beginning though, you'll notice that we stay on the eraser a little bit longer than what I'd really like. It looks okay, but it would be better if we could take some of that time and show a different tool. So what I'd like you to do is zoom into that section by pressing the plus key on your keyboard. And then once you have your playhead at the point in which you're ready to move away from the erasers into a different tool, Come over and choose the razor tool, C is the keyboard shortcut, and cut that clip. Now don't delete the part that you don't want. We simply want to replace this part with new footage. So let's come into the video bin, and inside the video bin you can find a clip. It's 4033. It's a different tool here. You can go ahead and play it here in the source monitor, but the key is you need an endpoint within the source monitor. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark the endpoint right here. I'm gonna press I on the keyboard. Then what you're gonna do is drag the video to the sequence. Now when you drag the video to the sequence, you'll get the standard insert video icon. In order for this to become a replace, what you wanna do is hold down the Option key on the Mac, Alt on Windows, and place it right on top of that clip. Once you let go of the mouse, you'll notice that that footage has been replaced with the new footage based upon the endpoint. And then it just fills the rest of the space to accommodate that area of the old clip. So now if we play this, you can see that we have successfully replaced a portion of the footage that had the erasers with this chamois. So that's one way to use Replace Edit. There is another way where you don't necessarily have to use an endpoint I'm going to go ahead and zoom out of the sequence by pressing the minus key on the keyboard. You'll notice down here towards the end, I have some footage here of the artist doing a drawing of her hand. What I'd like to do is get a close up of this drawing right around here, I suppose. So let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to make a cut. Again, I'm not being all that precise right here. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes, but I'll make a cut right here. So now what we want to do is perform a replace edit again, but we don't want to necessarily set an endpoint within the source monitor. So I'm going to go ahead and load a clip into the source monitor, which is 4049. And I'm going to move the playhead here within the source monitor to the point in which I want the new footage to appear within the sequence. So in this case, what we can do, instead of dragging from the source monitor, 
because we don't have an endpoint, we can simply come over here and right click or control click, and then we can choose replace with clip, and then we can choose from source monitor, match frame. And when we do that, you can see that it does in fact match the frame in which the playhead is sitting on within the source monitor. So now we get that replace edit to work perfectly. So there you go. The replace edit feature inside of Premiere gives you some ability to replace footage with new footage. In this video, what I'd like to do is show you how you can perform top and tail edits. They really give you a way to be really creative inside of your sequence without the hassle of marking in and out points. To demonstrate this, what I'd like you to do is come over and create a new sequence. Remember, the keyboard shortcut is Command N on the Mac. It would be Control N on the Windows side. And let's not worry about the preset at all. And we can name the sequence Top and tail for top and tail edits. So let's come over here and click OK. Once you click OK, what we want to do is basically build a montage of the different tools that the artist will use. And we want to set that to music. So the first thing that we want to do is figure out the clips that we want to use. If we come over to the video bin, inside the video bin, there's a whole bunch of different clips. What I'd like to do is select clip 4027 and then scroll down to 4035. With all of these selected, we want to drag these into the sequence. So just click and drag into the sequence. We do want to change the sequence settings. So I'll go ahead and click that. And you'll notice that we have an eraser. We have some pencils here, razor, charcoal, so on and so forth. So that looks pretty good. Of course, we want to set this to music, so what we want to do is come into our audio bin. We're going to use that same track that we've been using throughout the course. It's tellerofthetales.mp3. Let's drag and drop this right here in audio track one, then lock audio track one, because if you don't, when you perform these top and tail edits, you will be cutting the audio as well. So what is a top and tail edit? Well, a top and tail edit gives you the ability to cut the footage at the point of the playhead and lob off either the top of it or the tail of it. So let's take a look at the erasers, for example. If we want this to be the starting point or the end point, we can simply press Q on the keyboard to perform a top edit. You'll notice that Premiere will lob off this section of the footage and move everything down. I'll go ahead and press Q now, and you can see that that's the case. That's a top edit, a tail edit, is essentially the opposite. Let's say, for example, we want to get rid of the footage here. We would press W on the keyboard. Premiere will make a cut and lob off everything to the right of the time indicator. So I'll go ahead and press W, and you can see that that's the case. So Q and W, they're keyboard shortcuts. It's really easy. Now, what's nice about top and tail editing is you can do it on the fly to some extent. If I go ahead and press the space bar to play this, if I decide I want to perform a top edit and press Q, it will do that, but it stops the playhead from playing. Whereas if you perform a tail edit, it will cut and make the edit and continue to play. So I'll go ahead and press the space bar again, let this play for a little bit, and let's say I want to perform that tail edit. I'll press W. It performs that edit for you, and you'll notice it continues to play. We'll let it play a little bit longer, and let's say we want to perform another tail edit. I'll go ahead and press W. It makes that edit and continues to play. So that's really a pretty cool way to work inside of Premiere. Now, what we're doing here is essentially extracting the video footage away from the sequence and filling it up with the remaining footage. You can perform a lift instead if you want to work that way giving you an empty space within the sequence. So if you want to fill that space with additional B-roll or whatever the case may be, you could do that. What you need to do is hold down the Option modifier key, that would be Alt on Windows, when performing a top or a tail edit. So let's say, for example, I want to perform a top edit here. Traditionally, you would press Q, and it will get rid of that footage and move everything upstream. I'll go ahead and undo that, Command-Z or Control-Z. If you want to perform a lift, you would hold down the Option key here on the Mac, Alt on Windows. When you press Q, it gets rid of that footage but leaves that empty space so you can fill that with something else.
later on. So top and tail editing is really a different way to work inside of a sequence. You're not going to use it all that often, but you will run into situations where it does speed up your productivity, making it a lot easier to perform simple edits using the Q key and the W key. Remember, the Q key is to perform a top edit, and the W key is to perform a tail edit. Over the last couple chapters, we spent a lot of time editing inside the timeline within Premiere. What I'd like to do in this chapter is kind of take a step back and just review everything that you should know about the timeline so you can work as efficiently as possible when you start working on your own projects. So you'll notice right now that my sequence is highlighted. I see a border around it, so that panel has focus within the application. What you probably want to do is press the tilde key to go into a full screen view, so we're just looking at the timeline. At this point, you know that if you press the plus sign on your keyboard, you'll zoom in. The minus sign will zoom out. That's really important. And the backslash key will kind of fit the sequence in the window so you can see everything that's going on. Those are key keyboard shortcuts. The other thing that you can do is you can adjust the height of your tracks. If you click and drag, notice you can increase the height of your video track. If you click and drag with the shift key being held down, you'll adjust the height of all of your tracks. Now, if you have a scroll wheel on your mouse, you can just use the scroll wheel, which is really kind of nice. You can also use a command. Here's a little wrench icon. If you click it, there's all sorts of visual options for the timeline. Here, we can come down and choose expand all tracks. That way we can see all the waveforms associated with our audio. We can see the thumbnails with the video. And we looked earlier at this option up here in the top right hand corner where you can control exactly what you see for thumbnails. You can see thumbnails just at the video head or at the video head and tails, or you can have a continuous video thumbnail. So there's a lot of options up here as well, so keep that in mind. So if you decide that you want to collapse all of your tracks, you can come back to this wrench and choose that command. You'll notice right here we have the option of minimize all tracks, and they all collapse back down. The other thing that I want to point out is you can easily navigate through your timeline, as you know, based upon the arrow keys on your keyboard. If you press the down arrow key on the keyboard, you'll move forward through the sequence to the different edit points within the sequence, and the up arrow key moves you backwards. The other thing that you can do is you can quickly move to the beginning of the sequence by holding down the home button if you have an extended keyboard. If you don't, and you're working on something like a laptop, you can hold down the FN key and then use the left arrow key, and that will move you home. And you can also get to the end of the sequence by pressing the end key on your keyboard if you're working with an extended keyboard. Or if you're working with a laptop, you can hold down the FN key and use the right arrow key on your keyboard. So again, just a quick overview of some of the visual options and presentation options of the timeline to ultimately make you work as efficiently as possible inside the program. As we continue to talk about the timeline, I wanted to spend a moment to review how you can go about adding and removing tracks from your sequence. For the most part, it's fairly straightforward, but there are some options there that may not be all that obvious, so I'd like to review them. In order for us to do that, what I'm going to do is increase the height of the timeline panel. You'll notice I have a cursor in between the program monitor and the actual sequence. I get a two-way arrow. If I click and drag up, you'll notice I'm increasing the height of the timeline. So the first thing that you can do is drag clips into empty space within the sequence to create new tracks. For example, let's say I really wanted some new video footage to appear on video track four. If that's the case, simply click and drag the video clip from the project panel and drop it into that empty space within the sequence, and Premiere Pro will create that video track for you. I'll go ahead and undo that. The same is true for audio. If I expand the audio bin and grab one of these voiceover files, if I drag this in the empty space below everything within the audio tracks, when I let go of the mouse, the new audio track is created. Now, it doesn't go at the very bottom. That's reserved for the master track. We'll talk about the master track in greater detail 
when we talk about audio, but for right now, that's how you can go about adding a new audio track. Again, I'll go ahead and undo that. Now, what happens if you want to be able to create a new track without dragging in new media? Well, you can drag existing media. For example, if I grab this clip and drag it up here in the empty space, the new track will be created. But let's say you just want to manually create the track for whatever reason. Well, what you can do is right click or control click over here in this empty space. If you click anywhere else, you'll get different options, whether if you're in the actual sequence or over here to the left, it's really important to be over here in this blank space. If you want the track to show up in a certain order, then you could also be sensitive in terms of where you click in terms of the hierarchy of these video tracks. But for our purposes right now, if I right click or control click on video track three in this empty space, I can choose add track. You'll notice it creates video track four. Again, I'll go ahead and undo that. If I do that on video track two, right click or control click and choose add track, it's hard to tell, but it actually placed this new track here below the old video track three. To illustrate that, I guess I'll grab a clip here and place it on video track three, and also grab a clip here and place it on video track two. If I go ahead and right click or control click and choose add track, you'll notice the new track is between those two tracks. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll go ahead and undo that. The same is true for audio, by the way. If you right click or control click here, you can choose add track, and you'll notice a new track is added. Finally, you can add more than one track at a time. If you right click or control click, you can choose add tracks. Once you choose add tracks, you have a couple different options in terms of how many tracks you want to create, where you want the placement to be. You'll also notice that there's options for creating audio tracks with the video tracks. Now, audio is a little bit different than video. You'll notice we have submix tracks and some other specialty tracks, but we'll worry about that a little bit later on again when we talk about audio. But this is how you can add more than one track at a time. I'll go ahead and cancel out of this. Finally, you can also delete tracks. If you right click or control click, you can choose delete track and it will remove that track. I'll go ahead and undo that. I'm gonna place these two clips down here in video track one. You can also get rid of multiple tracks. So I'm gonna go ahead and right click or control click and we can choose delete tracks. And in this case, what I wanna do is get rid of all the video tracks and all the audio tracks that don't contain any information. So you'll notice we have all empty tracks selected from this menu. Certainly you could choose a specific audio or video track, but for our purposes, we're gonna leave it set to all empty tracks. When you click okay, all the empty tracks are removed. So hopefully that helps you understand how you can add and remove tracks from a sequence when you're working inside of Premiere. Something else that you should be aware of when working with the timeline inside of Premiere is having the ability to essentially turn off a track. So when you output the video, that track won't be included. And that can be really useful if you have things like graphics or even lower third graphics. If you don't know what lower third graphics are, if you just think about a traditional TV show, let's say for example, you're watching an interview, when the camera's on the interviewer, the interviewer's name will appear in the lower third of the video. And that's a graphic. And sometimes you may need to create a copy of the show without that graphic. Well, if you organize your project correctly and keep your graphics and lower thirds on their own tracks, you can easily disable them from output by clicking this little eye icon. You'll notice it's called the toggle track output command. And what that will do is disable that track so it won't be included when you output the show. So that can be really useful. Something similar exists for audio tracks. You'll notice in the audio section, you have an M button and an S button. The M button will mute the track. Now this can be really useful. Again, there's a good chance if you're sending this show to another news organization, they're gonna want their own voiceover on the show. So you're gonna to have to mute your particular audio track and output the video that way so that voiceover is not included. But you don't have to delete it from your project. It's still part of your project. So if you ever need to use it again, it's available to you. Now, the other option is the solo track option. And what the solo track option will do is essentially mute out all the other tracks. So it's a quick way to say, this is the only audio track I wanna use. So those are some nice options if you have to create alternate versions of your show. This gives you the ability to control what 
is output and what is not. Finally, you also have the ability to lock a track. We looked at this a little bit earlier when we were looking at top and tail edits. When you're performing those types of edits, you'll likely end up cutting the audio track as well. So to avoid that, you will lock it. And when you lock it, you'll notice it gets kind of hashed out here, which is a visual cue that you can't do anything to this track. It's locked, it's protected, it's untouchable. You can't do anything with it until you unlock it. So again, I just wanted to quickly review those features so you're aware that they're available. I'm certain you're going to run into scenarios where you're going to find them very useful. Premiere gives you the ability to add markers to your clips and to your sequences, and this can be a great way to leave notes for yourself or another editor. Let's say, for example, you're looking at your sequence, and this particular clip you decide needs to be color corrected. And you don't want to do it right now, but you want to leave a note for yourself to do it later on. If that's the case, what you can do is select the clip. And with the clip selected, you can come over and click the Add Marker button, or you can press M on your keyboard. You'll notice a little marker appears here inside the clip. Now, if you don't see this for some reason, it could be you don't have the option set. You can come up to the wrench here and choose Show Clip Markers. So if you do have Show Clip Markers selected, you should see the marker. Of course, now what we want to do is populate this marker with some information. In order for you to do that, you can press this same Add Marker button or you can press the M key on your keyboard. Because we still have this clip selected and we didn't move the time indicator, if we press M again or click this button, it will open up a dialog box. It won't add another new marker. And here we can go ahead and name this marker. I'll go ahead and name it Color Correction. And then the comment will be something like, maybe we need to color correct. Something along those lines. Now you'll notice you have a couple different options in terms of the type of marker that you can create. In all honesty, most of your markers will be comment markers, but you could work with something like a chapter marker. And this can be useful if you export your project to Encore and you're setting up a DVD. You also have the ability to work with a web link. And you can add flash cue points if you plan to deliver this video through the flash player. At this point, I'll come over here and click OK. Once you click OK, if you hover over the marker, a tooltip will appear displaying that information. So let's go ahead and quickly take a look again at how we can add a clip marker. It's important that you select the clip. And in this case, I'm going to move the time indicator to the point in which I want the marker to show up. And then you can go ahead and press M on your keyboard. Now, if you know you want to add a title and a comment right out of the gate, press M twice on your keyboard or click this button twice. And what that will do is add the marker and also open up the dialog box. In this case, I don't really have anything to say, so I'll just go ahead and type in marker 2 so we can see that we did in fact name this marker. If you click OK and hover over it, you should see in the tooltip the name of the marker. So that is a clip marker. And what's nice about the clip marker is that marker stays with the clip. If I have this clip selected in the sequence and I press F on the keyboard to load it into the source monitor, you will see that marker here in the source monitor as well. Now, you could add a marker to your sequence. Let's say, for example, right around here, we want to cut to some B-roll, but we don't have that B-roll. Notice I don't have a clip selected. If you don't have a clip selected within the sequence, and if you do, to deselect it, just click in the empty space. Actually, this was selected. So it is important to select in the empty space or click in the empty space. Once you do, nothing will be selected. If you press M on your keyboard once to add the marker, you can see it here. And once again, to open up the dialog box, we'll go ahead and name this B-roll. And then the comment will be add some B-roll. And what's really helpful when adding a marker to a sequence is you can add a duration. I'm just going to go ahead and add a couple seconds here. When you click OK, you'll see that the marker spans that duration now. And when you hover over it, of course, you see the tooltip, which will display the name and the comment. So there's a couple different ways that you can work with your markers. Of course, if you come up to the marker menu, there's all sorts of different options. You can come down here and add a marker this way. You can go to the next marker or the previous marker, so you can easily navigate from marker to marker. You can clear your markers, and you can also edit your markers. 
And then of course you can directly access the chapter marker and flash queue marker options here as well. So there's a lot of options in terms of how you can navigate from marker to marker and how you can manipulate these markers from this marker menu. But there's also a marker panel and that's available here on the left hand side. If you don't see it for some reason, you can begin to scroll over or you can go to the window menu and from the window menu you can choose markers and that will bring it forward. You'll notice right now I don't have anything selected so I'm seeing all the markers for the sequence. So if I move the time indicator here and add another marker, you'll notice that it shows up as well. I'll go ahead and name this marker three and click OK. So they're both available here. If you click on a clip, you'll see all the markers associated with clips in the sequence. And if you want to make some edits to that marker, whether it be the name, you can do that. The comment, you can make a change here as well. And you can also change the in and out point of the marker. Notice I'm increasing the out point and that's being adjusted here within the sequence. So markers, like I said, give you the ability to leave notes and comments to yourself or other editors. And it's a nice way to be able to quickly identify different areas of your project, which can be useful if you need to remember to do something a little bit later on and it's not something that you can do right away. Create a marker and leave a note for yourself. If you work with other Creative Cloud applications, you're probably already familiar with the History Panel. If you don't, what the History Panel allows you to do is go back in time as it records all the steps that you're taking within the program. Now this can be useful if you want to undo a specific operation or a series of operations. Certainly you can come up to the edit menu and from the edit menu you can choose undo multiple times. The keyboard shortcut is command Z. It would be control Z on Windows. But if you want to pinpoint an exact step that you took within the program, well then you want to go into the history panel. So you'll notice over here I have the project panel open. You can scroll to the right horizontally and then you'll see the history panel. If you don't see the history panel for some reason, you can always come up to the window menu and under the window menu you can choose history. So you'll notice right now I've taken a series of steps. Depending upon what you're doing inside your program would ultimately determine what you see in your history panel. If you've just opened a sequence, you won't see anything. But you'll notice I have a razor cut, a ripple delete. So if I want to go back to this ripple delete, all I have to do is click on it. And when I click on it, you'll notice that everything underneath it becomes grayed out. Everything else underneath it is about to be removed from the project as soon as I perform another operation. At this point, if you decide that you really don't want to go back this far in time and you really just want to come over to this slide edit, you have that ability. You can easily navigate through the different steps within the history panel. But once you come in here and choose something like this ripple delete, if you come in and make a modification, everything that's gray will be removed from the history panel. So in this case, if I come over and choose something like the razor tool and I make a cut here, you'll notice all that information is gone. If you undo that, Command Z or Control Z, that information is still gone. It's the same as going up one level in the history panel. So just be aware of that. Once you come up here and select something, everything that's grayed out will be removed from the history panel. But the history panel can be a great way to be able to go back in time, especially if you're trying to pinpoint a precise step that you've taken within the program. I wanted to quickly talk about render files inside of Premiere. When you look at the timeline, you'll notice that you see a yellow line up here for the most part, but sometimes you'll also see a red section. The yellow means that Premiere will probably have to do some on-the-fly rendering in order to give you real-time playback, but typically you're not going to drop any frames and you should get a fairly accurate representation of what the video will look like when you do export it. If you have this red bar, that means that Premiere may not be able to play the video without dropping frames. It might, but you run into the chance of Premiere actually dropping frames. So there's something that you can turn on here inside the program monitor that will act as a good guide so you know exactly what's going on as you play the video back. Up here you'll click on the little wrench. You can come down and choose Show Dropped Frame Indicator. And you'll notice right now it's green. And if I play a little bit of this, it stays green, meaning 
that Premiere is not dropping any frames. So what I've done here, where you see the red line, is I've applied an effect to this clip. I just distorted it. It's a fairly complicated effect. When you start distorting things, it takes a little bit of horsepower to be able to render that. So what I want to do is take a look at this and play it back. And as we play it back, keep your eye on the dropped frame indicator. As I play it, we're going to get into the red section. You'll notice that the drop frame indicator has turned yellow. And if you hover over it, it will tell you how many frames were dropped during playback. Now, depending upon what your needs are, that may be fine. You probably get the gist of the effect. But if you really want to see it, you can render this section. There's a couple different ways that you can render the section. What I'm going to do here is just mark an in point and an out point in the middle of the red section. And the reason for that is I want to show you what else Premiere will display here. In order for you to render something, all you have to do is come up to the Sequence menu. And under the Sequence menu, you'll notice you have a lot of different rendering options. You could select that clip that's causing this red line to appear and choose Render Selection. But for our purposes right now, what I'm going to do is choose Render Effects Into Out. And what Premiere will do is render the effects between the in point and the out point. And it's actually creating a render file now. And this render file will create a video preview so you can play it back in real time without dropping any frames. Depending upon the complexity of the effect would ultimately determine how long this render will take. We're almost done here. But once it is complete, like I said, you'll be able to play back the video in real time without dropping any frames. And you'll also notice that that section turns green. By rendering this section, we now get this real-time playback. So hopefully these lines up here, the different colors, make a little bit more sense now. Understanding what rendering is all about and how it can be beneficial should also be a little bit clearer now. But what I'm going to do now is just turn off the drop frame indicator by coming up to the top right-hand corner here and deselecting show drop frame indicator. As we perform edits within our Premiere projects, oftentimes we are using keyboard shortcuts. If you want to perform an insert or an overwrite edit, you know that you can use the comma or the period key. But we also have those buttons available here underneath our source monitor and our program monitor. Now, you may not ever use these buttons. And if you don't want to use these buttons, you can turn them off. These buttons are called transport controls, and you have the ability to turn them off quickly and easily either in the source monitor or the program monitor by clicking this little wrench. When you click the little wrench, you'll notice that there's an option to show transport controls. If you deselect that, the transport controls are removed, giving you more space to actually look at the video footage. However, Let's assume that you do use these buttons. I'll go ahead and turn them back on by choosing Show Transport Controls. Once you show the transport controls, you'll see a little plus sign. If you click that, you have the ability to customize what buttons appear within the transport controls. Not only can you add additional buttons, you can also add dividers to organize your buttons. So let's say, for example, you really want safe margins to be available to you within your transport controls. All you have to do is click and drag it into this area, and it will appear. Likewise, if you want to get rid of a button, all you have to do is click and drag it away from this box. And as you do that, you'll notice it's removed. At that point, you can change the location of any one of the other buttons, so you can organize this to best suit your needs. Now, after you mess around with it a little bit, if you want to get back to the default layout, you can choose Reset Layout, and it will restore the transport controls to the factory default settings. I'll come over here and click Cancel. That, too, would cancel out any changes that you've made. So, again, not a huge feature, but something that I wanted to make you aware of. If you want to customize the transport controls, you certainly have that ability here inside of Premiere. Thank you.
When you're cutting a program together inside of Premiere, there's a good chance you'll have a need to work with a still image. In this chapter, I want to review how you can work with still images inside the program. Before we do that, however, what I'd like to do is quickly review some preferences and how you can go about importing images. So here on the Mac, what I'd like you to do is come up to the Premiere Pro menu. Under the Premiere Pro menu, you can choose Preferences, and from there, you can choose General. If you're on the Windows side, you can go to the Edit menu, and from there, you can choose Preferences, and then you can choose General. The keyboard shortcut is Command, Comma. It would be Control, Comma on Windows. Once you choose that general option, the Preferences dialog box will open. And remember, we have this still image default duration, and it's set to 150 frames, which means if you're working with a sequence that's set to 30 frames per second, you get five seconds of footage for that still image. And that can be adjusted in the timeline after the fact. This is just the default duration. If you know that you want your images to be, let's say, 10 seconds, you can go ahead and increase this to 300 frames. The other thing that I want to point out is that there is an option called Default Scale to Frame Size. And this can be helpful if you're trying to create a slideshow and you want the slideshow to fill the frame size or at least fit within the frame size. But it can be a negative thing if you think you're going to perform any type of transformation on that image. For example, if you're going to increase the size, if you automatically scale it to fit within the frame, if you need to increase the size, you're not going to have the data there and it's going to look somewhat pixelated. So oftentimes, you're not going to work with this option. Let's come down here and click OK to exit out of this dialog box. How can we import images? Well, we import images like we would import any other media. Let's come over to the media browser and I'm going to go ahead and press the tilde key to go into a full screen view. I happen to have a folder on my desktop called images. We already have these images inside our images folder that's included in our project. So you may just want to watch this. But if you want to import images, one thing that I definitely recommend is going into the thumbnail view. That way you can actually see what the image is. And then all you'll have to do to import the still image is to select it or select multiple still images. And then you can right click or control click and choose import, much like you would any other piece of media. Now what is nice is that Premiere supports a wide range of file formats. In fact, I'll be surprised if you run into a format that Premiere doesn't support. But as you look at your thumbnails, you may want to filter your thumbnails based upon file type. And you can do that by coming up here to the top corner of the panel and clicking this filter menu. If you just want to see PNG files, for example, come over here and choose PNG, you'll notice that the view is filtered. Now you can add to that by coming up here and choosing another format. Let's say we also want to see JPEGs, and you'll notice we see all the JPEGs now. Let's say you also want to see TIFF, so I'll come down here and choose TIFF, and then those files are added. So this filter menu can be really helpful when trying to find particular file formats. Like I said, Premiere Pro supports a wide range of formats. You'll notice anything from a cinema DNG file to a Canon RAW file, all the way down to a Photoshop file, as we saw earlier. So a lot of support here for a lot of different file formats when it comes to working with still images. When it comes to working with still images inside of your sequences within Premiere, they're relatively straightforward. They behave much like any other piece of media. The biggest challenge that you'll have when it comes to working with still images is getting the sizing correct. If you think about high definition video, the best TVs display video at 1920 by 1080. Certainly there's some exceptions there with some new products coming out, but for the most part, that's the biggest size that you can work with. A two megapixel digital camera will take an image bigger than that. And if you think about the camera on your cell phone, those are typically 10 megapixels or higher. So your images could be quite a bit larger than your sequence settings. So what I'd like to do in this video is just show you how you can deal with those potential issues. Now, if you've been watching this course, you know that when I set up a sequence, what I like to do is drop in a video clip that's fairly representative of the media that I'll be working with. So I'll let Premiere set up the sequence settings and I don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to come into the video bin 
And inside the video bin, I just want you to grab a video clip, doesn't really matter which one, and drag it into the timeline to create a new sequence set to those settings. Right now my view here is set to 10%, I'll set it to 100% for now. You can delete this clip if you're not going to use it. So you can select it, press delete, and you'll notice if you come up to the sequence menu and choose sequence settings, your sequence settings are preserved based upon that video clip. So what we want to do is take a look at what happens when we drop an image into our sequence. Now if we open up the images bin, we have several different images and they range from landscape images, which are horizontal images, to portrait images, which are vertical images. If we hover over handhold.jpg, we can see that the still image is 5,466 pixels by 3,644. Well, that's quite a bit larger than our sequence settings. They're set to 1280 by 720. So let's see what happens. If we drop this image into the sequence, you'll notice it looks like a piece of video footage, but it comes in one to one. So it's really magnified here. If we double click handhold, in the project panel, we'll load it into the source monitor. And when we load it into the source monitor, you can see that the image has a lot more information in it. We're just seeing a small portion of it, but it is one to one. Now, this is a clip for all intensive purposes. If we want to increase the length of it, we could do that just like a video clip. Really, any basic editing operations that we've learned about, we could perform those on this still image. But at this point, what I'd like to do is see more of what we're looking at over here in the source monitor in the program monitor. You have a couple different options, by the way. What you can do is select the clip right here and right click or control click on it. And in the contextual menu, you can choose scale to frame size or set to frame size. And that will scale it down. But if you want manual control over it, you do have to set your zoom level to 10%. And once you do that, you can double click on the image and you'll get these resize handles. And you can just click and drag to resize the image and get it to the point in which you're happy. So that's one way of working. Now, you could use that default preference of having Premiere automatically size the still images for you. The downside to that is if I wanted to animate this clip and zoom into it, I can do that now because I have all this information associated with this image file. If you automatically scale it to the sequence, you lose that information. So this gives you a little bit more flexibility. So what happens if you're working with an image that's maybe in portrait mode? Let's take a look at that. I'm going to come over here and set this to a higher percentage so we can see it a little bit more clearly. And if we come into the images bin and scroll down a little bit, we have a whole bunch of different images here. And if you double click them, you'll begin to load them into the source monitor. Here we have an image that almost looks like a square. If we drag and drop this into the sequence, you'll notice we get very different results. Again, if we look at this hand image and hover over it, we can see it's 401 by 405 pixels. So it's quite a bit smaller than the sequence settings. But this is okay. We just get this black boxing around the image. Oftentimes, that's what you want in terms of how you're going to present the image. One thing that you have to know about this, though, is that this really isn't black. This is really transparent. Meaning, if I come over and grab something like another image or even another video clip, and I place the video clip on a different track, so in this case, I'll just drag this up to track two, and then I'll take this subclip here and drag it on track one, you'll see the video underneath the image. So you just need to be aware of that, that you're working with transparency there. And you can use that to your advantage in different situations. But as you can see, working with still images within the sequence is very similar to working with video. The biggest difference is, however, you have to worry about the size of the image and make the necessary adjustments to that image so the project can accommodate it. In the last video, I mentioned the big advantage of bringing an image in at its full resolution is having the ability to perform animation like scales and pans and things along those lines. If you come over here and you make an adjustment to the image to fit it to the frame, 
you're kind of forcing the image to always be that size. If you wanted to increase the size of the image, you're not going to have good results with that. The best way to scale an image that's much larger than what you want it to be is by using the effect controls. If we come over and click on the effect controls tab, you'll notice that we have a timeline here inside this panel, and this timeline is linked to the sequence timeline. So if this time indicator moves in the effect panel, you'll notice the time indicator moves inside the sequence as well. What I'd like you to do is come over and click on the disclosure triangle for the motion effects, and you can see that we have a couple options here for position and scale. There's also some others down here as well, but let's focus on these two. In order for us to control the scale and the position, we need to set a keyframe. You set a keyframe by clicking on this little stopwatch, and you'll notice that little triangles appear over here. So what we want to do first is reduce the scale. We want the image to be a lot smaller when the sequence starts playing. So I'm just clicking and dragging with the scrubby slider, and I'm reducing this. You can also type in a value here. Let's say you want it to be 15% and tab away from it. That's a little bit too small, so I'll come back up to 25%, and I think that's perfect. In terms of the position, I think it's okay right now. But what we want to do is create some type of animation. So we're going to move the time indicator downstream. This looks pretty good. And what we need to do is add a new keyframe so we can change the value associated with the scale property and a keyframe for the position property. Now you can manually add these keyframes by clicking on these little icons right here. The other thing that you can do is just change a value. So in this case, if I click and drag to increase the scale, you'll notice a keyframe has been placed and we can see that the image is being scaled. Now you can also click and drag the image as well over here inside the program monitor, which makes it a little bit easier to work with the image visually. Once you let go of the mouse, you can see a keyframe's been added. At this point, if we move the time indicator back to frame one and press the space bar, we can see this animation play. And I think that looks pretty good. Oftentimes when you're working with still images inside of Premiere, you're gonna add a little bit of motion to the images to add some visual interest for the viewer. Now what happens if you want to change the location of the keyframes to either speed up the animation or to slow down the animation? Well, all you have to do is click and drag a marquee around these keyframes, and at that point you can click and drag to the left to reduce the amount of time that it takes, so to speed it up, or you can click and drag to the right so it takes a little bit longer. Now the other thing that you can do is you can right click on one of these keyframes or control click if you're on a Mac and here you can choose temporal interpolation and here you have several different options you can choose something like ease in and ease out if you don't know what those are ease in will start the animation at a slower pace and then pick up speed towards the end and ease out is the opposite but then you can also choose something like bezier and if you do that once you come into this image you'll notice you have a curve that you can begin to play with in terms of how you can change the position. So if I click and drag this down a little bit, I can make a little bit more of a swooping animation. So again, if I come over here and play that, you'll kind of see a little bit more of a swoop take place. So those are some of your options for adding some additional visual interest to your still images inside of Premiere. You can use these effect controls to create keyframes for different properties and animate those properties over time. When cutting a sequence in Premiere, you may want to smooth out some of your edit points with transitions. And you can easily apply transitions to both video and audio. In order for us to apply a transition, we need to have the effects panel open. You may have to scroll over to the right to find the effects tab. If you still don't see it for some reason, you can come up to the window menu and under the window menu, you can choose effects. Now, once you're inside the effects panel, you can see that there's several different categories. Clearly what we want to talk about right now are video transitions. And more specifically, we want to look at a dissolve. In fact, the cross dissolve is the default transition that Adobe has set up for Premiere. So what we want to do is add a cross dissolve between this cut here. So I'm going to zoom into this section of the timeline. And then all you have to do is grab the cross dissolve and drop it in between those two clips. When you let go of the mouse, you'll see the cross dissolve. When you play the video, you'll see that dissolve. Again, undo that. Another way, of course, is to select the edit point 
and you can call up the default transition by using the keyboard shortcut Command D. It would be Control D on Windows, and you can see that the cross dissolve has been applied. Now, like I said, you can also apply transitions to audio, and this can be really helpful if you have changes within your audio track. Maybe you have a period of silence, and then music starts playing, or people start talking. You may want to make that transition a little more subtle, and an audio transition can make that happen. What I want to do is scroll over to the left here, and if we listen to this, we'll hear the music start playing. So it's kind of abrupt, and I'd like that to be a little bit more gradual. So we're going to come over and expand the audio transitions. In here, we have crossfade. Constant power typically gives you the best results, but you can experiment with these. And we can apply it the same way. Just click and drag and place it at the end of the clip. You could also place it between two audio tracks. It gets a little bit more difficult when you're trying to manipulate audio in that way. But in this case, it's relatively easy, and it's fairly straightforward. If we play this... I don't know if you heard that through your speakers, but if you're following along, you certainly would hear that transition take place. So audio transitions and video transitions are very easy to apply here inside of Premiere. In the last video, we saw how easy it was to apply transitions to video clips and audio clips. What I'd like to do in this video is review some of the options you have after you apply a transition. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom into this a little bit, and we can see we have this cross dissolve. If you hover over it, you'll actually get some information about the cross dissolve in terms of its duration, its starting point, and ending point. Now, like many things inside of Premiere, there are some default configuration options for transitions. If we come up to the Premiere Pro menu and choose Preferences and then select General. Now, if you're on the Windows side, you'll go to the Edit menu, and you'll choose Preferences, and then you'll choose General. It's going to open up the Preferences dialog box, and you can see that the default video transition duration is 15 frames, which if you're running at 30 frames per second is half a second. So you may want to increase that to 30 frames per second. You can come in here and make modifications to all of these options. So once you're done doing that, you can click OK, and you'll notice that that doesn't change transitions that have already been applied. It's only for new transitions. But if you do want to change the overall duration here, you can just click and drag, much like you would a video clip. Now, you can also replace this transition with something else. If we come over to the Video Transitions folder, we can go into something like a wipe. And if you prefer, you could always perform a search. If you type in wipe, you'll notice that the effects panel gets filtered out to show you just the effects that contain the word wipe. So in this case, I want to wipe. If you click and drag and drop this on top of the cross dissolve, you're not going to have both transitions, but rather the cross dissolve will be replaced with the wipe. Now, if you select the wipe, which it is right now, you can come over to the effect controls panel. And as long as you have that transition selected, you should see some options here. Now, what's interesting over here on the right hand side is you have the ability to increase the transition on the left hand side and the right hand side. You can also perform a roll edit if you click and drag kind of in the middle area. You can move the whole thing over. Now, something interesting is happening here. You'll see we have a series of lines that appear right here on the right-hand side. Well, the reality is, as you place this transition right here, if we look at the timeline, we don't have enough media for this transition to take place. So what Premiere Pro will do is add a still frame for the duration of where you see these hatch lines. And this can work nicely in a situation where we have just an image like this. The viewer will never notice it. But if there was some action going on, like a sports game, something like that, then all of a sudden the sports action would stop and you would see kind of a freeze frame. It may look a little weird. So you need to use this cautiously. Now, different wipes may have different settings. Down here towards the bottom, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see that you can control the border color and the border width. You can also show the actual sources. Right now we have A and B, but if we check this box, we'll see the actual sources. But if we watch this transition here in the timeline, we can see the wipe looks fine. But maybe you do want to make another change. Maybe you want a border. Well, what you can do is increase the border width here. You can also change the border color if you want. And if we watch this now, we'll see that border. So 
it's important to spend some time experimenting with these transitions to get a better understanding as to what's available to you inside of Premiere. But remember, each transition may have its own set of options, which are always available here in the Effect Controls panel. So again, these transitions can help you create smoother transitions between your cuts inside of your sequence. Premiere Pro makes it really easy to apply transitions across multiple clips within a sequence. Now remember, the default transition inside of Premiere is a cross dissolve, and you can change that, but for right now, let's just say we're happy with the cross dissolve. And remember, you can control the default duration of a transition. It's available in the general section of the Preferences dialog box. It's right here. You can change this if need be. I'm going to leave it set to 30 frames. I think that's fine. I'll come over here and click OK. To apply a transition to many edit points or clips within your sequence, just click and drag to select those clips. And once you select those clips, all you have to do is come up to the Sequence menu. And under the Sequence menu, you can choose Apply Default Transitions to Selection. You can also use the keyboard shortcut, which is Command-Shift-D. Now when you do that, the transitions are applied to your clips. And if you play your sequence, you can see that that's the case. Now, if you want to control the timing of it, let's say, for example, you want the transition to be longer in all instances, you would undo that, Command-Z or Control-Z on Windows. You'd go back to the Preferences dialog box and you would change that default duration. Again, I'm happy with the 30 frames, but what if you want to use a different transition? For example, maybe you do want the wipe to be the default transition. If that's the case, come over to the Effects panel, right-click or Control-click on the Wipe video transition, and in the contextual menu, you can choose Set Selected as Default Transition. When you do that, you'll see that highlight appear around it, which means now if I click and drag around all these clips and apply that default video transition, you'll see that now we have wipes instead of cross dissolves here within this sequence. There you go. So when you're working in a situation like this where you need to apply transitions in between many clips, this really can be a good solution. Use the default video transition to your advantage. And remember, you can go into the Preferences dialog box and configure that default duration to best suit the needs for that particular area within your sequence. And if you can lay down all those transitions, and that's really not the default duration you want for transitions in other places within your sequence, just go back and change your preferences. Remember, the preferences aren't retroactive. They don't go back and change the duration of transitions already applied within the sequence. Adobe has added a fairly robust titling tool inside of Premiere. Before you create a title, it can be a good idea to place your time indicator in the area in which you want the title to appear. The only reason for that is you'll get the appropriate reference image inside the titling tool. That's really the only reason. So to create a new title, what you'll do is come up to the title menu, and from there you can choose New Title. And for our purposes right now, we're going to choose Default Still. This will get you comfortable with the titling tool. This will open up a dialog box called New Title. You'll notice that your video settings are pre-configured here. If you want to change them for the title, you can do that. And then you can name the title. I'm going to go ahead and call this Headline. And then you can click OK. Once you click OK, you're brought into the titling tool. If you work with other programs like Photoshop, Illustrator, or InDesign, a lot of these features will already make sense to you. In terms of that reference image, you'll notice it appears here in the background. If you want to turn that off, you can by clicking this button. So you'll notice that the graphic you're about to create is transparent. So when you're ready to create the title, you want to come over and choose the Type Tool. With the Type Tool selected, all you have to do is come over and click to get a blinking cursor. Then you can type in the name of your title. In this case, it'll be Gesture Drawings. This is what will show up on screen. At this point, you can select individual characters, and with these characters selected, if you wanted to manipulate them in any way, you can do that. 
You have some button controls up here towards the top. You have similar options over here on the right hand side. So there's several different ways to perform similar operations. For our purposes, we want to treat all the text the same. So I'm going to come over and choose the selection tool. With the selection tool, you can then reposition the title easily. If you want to align it to the center, there's some buttons here that you can use. You can align it vertically to the center or horizontally to the center. If you click it, you'll see that it becomes centered. And you can nudge it around using the arrow keys on your keyboard. And if you hold down the shift key while using an arrow key, you'll move it in larger pixel increments. So if you want to change the appearance of the type, like I said, you have several options up here towards the top. You can choose a different typeface. You can choose a different weight or make it italic in this menu. There's some buttons here that will do the same. You can also control the size, the kerning. You can also control the leading. You'll notice, again, all those options are also available over here on the right-hand side. You can also control its position and its width and its height and its opacity. A lot of different options here. A lot of property configurations that you can control. Let's say, for example, you wanted to add a little bit more depth to this title. You can change the fill color, but I think the white looks nice in this case. So if you scroll down a little bit, you'll find that there's even more options. You can do something like add a stroke. And if you come over here and click add, the stroke is added. And from there, you can refine it further. Right now, it's set to edge for the type, but you could choose something like depth, and you'll notice you get a very different look. If you don't like it, you can simply click delete, and it will be removed. Maybe in this case, something like a drop shadow will make more sense. So you can come over and select shadow, and you'll notice that you have several different properties for that shadow. So it's important to kind of look through all the different properties that are available for the title here inside this panel. You'll also notice that there's some title styles already built for you. But I think for this particular situation, this looks good. When you're done, there's no save button or anything like that. So sometimes people get nervous about it. But all you have to do is close out of this dialog box. And when you do, you should see the still image headline appear within your project panel. At that point, all you have to do is click and drag it into your sequence. And you can control the duration of it just like you would any other image or clip. You can perform really any basic edits that we looked at earlier. If you want to apply transition to it, you can certainly do that. If I come over to the Effects tab and I want to apply a Cross Dissolve, I can come in here and type in Cross, and you'll notice that Cross Dissolve appears, and I can just drop it right on here. And if we play this, you can see the title appear within the video. So that's how you can work with titles inside of Premiere. The great thing is if you ever want to make a modification or change, all you have to do is double click the clip and you'll be brought back into that same dialog box. Using the title tool, you can make it really easy on yourself to create a lower third. Remember, a lower third is typically used in a situation where you need to identify someone or something. You'll see graphics down here in the lower third section of the video. So in this case, we want to identify the artist. You'll notice inside the images bin, there's a file called lower third.png. Just go ahead and drag that into your sequence. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit because we're zoomed in quite a bit. And you can see it's a really simple graphic. But what we want to do now is we want to place the name of the artist inside this little background that we created. Again, creating this graphic is really easy in a program like Photoshop. So with my time indicator in the right location, that ensures that I'll be able to see this clip in the background so I can use it as a reference image. We can come up to the title menu, and from the title menu, we can choose new title, and we're going to go ahead and choose default still. Again, we're going to get this new title dialog box. We're going to call this Amanda, and then we can come over here and click OK. Once you click OK, we now have the ability to type in her name. So I'm going to come over and choose the type tool. With the type tool, I'm going to click to add a text field. I'll type in her name. And then if you want to change any attribute, you can select the text with your eye beam, or you can come over and highlight the selection tool. With it selected, if you want to change something like the color, you can come over to the properties panel and change the color. In this case, we may want it to be something quite a bit darker. So I'll go ahead and click OK. 
once you click OK, it's a little bit more legible. You can also choose a different typeface. So in this drop down menu here, I'm going to go ahead and choose something completely different. I'll go with Gil Sands. And obviously, it's a little bit too big now. And I don't want it to be light. I actually want it to be bold so it's a little bit thicker. And I'm going to go ahead and change the size. I'm just going to use this scrubby slider to do that. And I think that looks pretty good. We can now position it with our arrow keys on the keyboard. And there we go. Once you're happy with this, you can close out of the titling tool. Then all you have to do is drag Amanda on top of that graphic. And I'm just going to go ahead and change the duration. And here we go. If we go ahead and play that, it shows up. Now, if we wanted to, again, we could add a cross dissolve here and here. So let's come over to the effects tab. I have cross dissolve. I'm going to drop it on the front of this clip. And I'm also going to drag it and drop it on the front of this title. Now when we play it, they both fade in. So that looks nice. Now what's great about this lower third background graphic is you can create as many titles as you need for as many people or things that you need to identify within the video. Remember, the graphic part is a separate component. The title is a separate component, so you could add literally any title here. If we wanted to change her name, we could do that and display a different name. So that's really the beauty of working with this background graphic when working with lower thirds. It's really easy to update the type associated with it. Creating rolling credits or crawling credits inside of Premiere is just as easy as creating a title. Rolling credits, of course, are credits that will animate vertically, much like you would see at the end of a movie. Crawling credits are credits that will animate horizontally, much like a ticker that you'll see at the bottom of a screen on a financial news program. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we can create these types of titles. What you want to do is come up to the title menu, and from the title menu, you can choose new title. And off new title, you can go ahead and select either default role or default crawl. For right now, we'll start off with the default role. We have to go ahead and name the title and confirm the video settings. I'll go ahead and call this credits, and then you can click OK. Once you click OK, we can start adding our text. Now, if you have a lot of copy, I don't recommend typing it here inside of the title tool. Instead, you should use some type of text editor. I have text edit here with some text. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this to the clipboard, and then I'll return back to Premiere. With the type tool selected, go ahead and click, and then paste that text. Now, Clearly, the text isn't really sized properly, and we need to add some breakpoints. But let's go ahead and worry about the size first. We can do that by coming over and choosing the selection tool. Then we can reduce the size of the text. After doing that, we can change the color. I'll come over here and change it to black or something really dark. Then you can click OK. And what we want to do now is come over and choose the type tool. And with the type tool, I'm going to come over here and add some carriage returns. So I think that looks pretty good. You can then come over and choose the selection tool and reposition it. If you want to change the size of the text, again, to modify it a little bit, you can do that. I'll go ahead and increase it slightly. And you may want to change something like the letting, and that's pretty easy to do as well. Just click and drag this to the right. So I think that looks pretty good. And again, we could worry about the actual visibility of it if we wanted to add a drop shadow or stroke. But for right now, let's just say we're happy with that. Now, what you want to do is come over here and click this button right here, which is the Roll Crawl Options. And if you click it, you'll notice you have a couple different options in terms of title type. In this case, we definitely want to roll, but then we get to choose timing. We can add pre-roll and post-roll, and we can apply an ease in or an ease out. For our purposes, what we want to do is come over here and just choose Start On Screen and End Off Screen. That way, it will animate from the bottom and go all the way up to the top. So I think this looks good. We can come over and click OK. Once we click OK, we can close out of the title tool. Once you click out of the title tool, you can grab that title, which is credits. You'll notice it's a video, and drop it into the sequence where you want the credits to appear. And then go ahead and press the space bar to take a look. Now, we could control the speed of this if we change the duration of it. That certainly will impact the speed. 
can see it's a little bit slower now, and that might be a little bit more appropriate for this. But there you go. That's how you can create a rolling credit. Pretty easy. Now, what's great about this is if you ever wanted to change it over to a crawl, you can do that. All you have to do is double click this to open up the title dialog box again. And then you'll come over to this little button again and you'll choose crawl left or crawl right. I'm going to go ahead and choose crawl left and click OK. Now, clearly, we don't want these carriage returns. So I'm going to come over here and choose the type tool and get rid of them. Go ahead and press delete on the keyboard. It's getting a little bit difficult to see now. So I'll scroll over. And I'll press delete again, bring that up a line. And again, I'll scroll over and I'll press delete one more time to move this line of text up. Once we're happy with that, we can come over and choose the selection tool and I can just place it over here. I think this will be a good spot for it. And again, if we come up here and click the roll crawl options, what we want to do is start off screen and end off screen. Go ahead and click OK. Once you click OK, everything will be updated. If we go ahead and take a look at this now, now our text will crawl along the bottom of the screen. And again, timing wise, we may need to slow that down a little bit. But I think you get the idea. Premiere Pro makes it really easy to create rolling and crawling credits. Once you're done cutting your project, you're going to want to export it. And you have a lot of options built into Premiere. In fact, Premiere has a separate application essentially built into it, which is Adobe Media Encoder. Now, in order for you to access Media Encoder, you need a sequence selected, or at least one sequence selected. So how do you select a sequence? Well, you can have the sequence selected here within the timeline panel, or if you prefer, you can select a sequence here in the project panel. Now you can select more than one sequence, which can be really useful if you have several different sequences and you want them all to be exported out in the same way. I'm not going to show you that, but what you would do is just choose multiple sequences here within the project panel. And remember, you can do that by holding down the command key or the shift key if they're next to one another. And then you can go up to the file menu and choose that export command. But in order for us to see all the options, I only want one sequence selected. With this sequence selected, you can then come up to the file menu and choose export, and then you can choose media. Now this is going to open up the export settings dialog box. And like I said, this is essentially Adobe Media Encoder. Now if we take a look at the left hand side, this is really important. Right now our source scaling is set to scale to fit, but notice you have all these different options. It's just a preview right here in this area. But what's really important is the source range. If you have in and out points, specified within your sequence, well, right now, that's all that will be output. So you may want to choose entire sequence if you're trying to create a master video. But this option here, sequence in and out, can be really helpful if you're just experimenting with different export settings. Over here on the right-hand side, there's a series of export settings. And if you have a lot of experience encoding video, have at it. But if you haven't really spent a lot of time exporting and encoding video, I would recommend sticking with the presets that Adobe has built for you. There's also an option down here called Custom. And what that allows you to do is set an area right here within the Export Settings dialog box. So if we just wanted to see this one section, we can mark the in and out point here and only export out these 13 seconds. Again, this is really helpful, especially if you just want to show a section of the video to a client or if you are in fact experimenting with different export settings. Like I said, I'm interested in producing a master, so I'm going to go ahead and select entire sequence from this menu. Now what's also important if you are choosing entire sequence is that your entire sequence is what you want. A lot of times I'll move clips downstream to get them out of the way and it's possible to leave a clip 20 minutes down in time within your timeline, and that will add time to the overall video. So keep an eye right here on this indicator in terms of how long your program actually is. So once you're ready to export out a master, there's a couple things that you have to do. Up here towards the top, you probably want to match your sequence settings. That way, all of your configuration options are automatically set up for you. 
Then you can specify the output name if you don't like it. By default, it'll be the same as the sequence. And if you click on that link, you can specify an exact location in terms of where you want the rendered file to go. I'll go ahead and cancel out of this. Now down here towards the bottom, you do have options in terms of configuring different video and audio settings. We are getting a summary right up here towards the top in terms of what's about to happen. But if I collapse this, it'll make a little more room for these options. You'll notice that there's an effects tab, there's a video tab, an audio tab, and a captions tab. But like I said, I'm pretty happy with everything that's configured here by default. The only thing that you may want to choose down here towards the bottom is use maximum render quality. It's just going to add a little bit more time to the rendering process. Ultimately, you'll get the best possible results selecting this option, but you'll find that there's little difference between selecting this and not selecting this. If you have a lot of effects, it's probably worthwhile. If you don't, it's probably not. Then you can click export. And once you click export, you'll essentially be locked out of Premiere. Premiere will use all the computer horsepower for rendering that video. If you want, you can click Q, which will add it to the Adobe Media Encoder Q, giving you the ability to come back into Premiere and continue editing. So that's a general overview of the export settings inside of Premiere. And like I said, if you want to create a master, good idea to come up here and just check match sequence settings. There's probably a good chance that your video will end up online. And if that's the case, I'd like to show you some options that are available inside the export dialog box. What I'd like you to do is come up to the file menu and from there you can choose export and then you can select media. Command M is the keyboard shortcut that would be control M on the Windows side. Now over here in the export settings, you'll notice that there's a format drop down menu. And let's say for example, you have a client that is asking for a QuickTime movie. You can come over and choose that option. And a format like QuickTime can use a variety of codecs. Now you can choose from a preset here, or if you prefer, you can come into the video tab and you'll notice that there's a video codec section. In this drop down menu, there's all sorts of different codecs that QuickTime supports. Now, if you're working on the Windows side, you may see different codecs. For example, Windows machines cannot export out video using the Apple ProRes codec. Apple just doesn't license their codec in that way. So in this case, if we wanted to do something like choose animation, we could do that. And now we're using the animation codec, but it will ultimately be a QuickTime movie. QuickTime is an okay format for web delivery. The downside is you need a plugin in the web browser to play the QuickTime video. Instead, what you should probably choose is H.264. H.264 is a universal Kodak format that's supported by all major web browsers, so you know that it can play with a web browser not using a plugin, simply by using the video element within an HTML document. Now, you'll notice that there's several options here within the video tab. If you wanted to change the width and height, you can do that. Just uncheck this and then make your modifications. You can also change the frame rate. And as you scroll down, you'll notice that there's some other options here. Notice something like the bit rate settings is automatically set to VBR, one pass. You'll notice that there's three options here. There's CBR. CBR uses a constant bit rate throughout the video. The downside to this is if you have sections in your video that have a lot of action, Premiere can't dedicate any additional resources to that section of the video. That's not the case with VBR. So if you choose something like VBR and you have something like a newscast with just a talking head, but then you cut away to some action sequences, those action sequences will have more resources dedicated to them than just the talking head. So that's really helpful. You get better quality video doing that. And then there's VBR2 pass, which just takes a little bit longer to render. You'll also notice that you have options for a target bit rate and a maximum bit rate. Premiere will give you an estimated file size right here towards the bottom. So if you wanted to make sure that your estimated file size was smaller, so you're getting a smaller video, you can drag this target bitrate slider to the left, and you can also limit the maximum bitrate in areas. So just make sure you're aware of that. Additionally, there's an audio tab, and you can customize the audio settings. AAC is a fairly universal format, but let's say you're trying to save file size, you may switch the channels from stereo 
to mono, and you'll notice that that goes down a little bit. Now, this isn't completely accurate. It's just an estimation. What I really like about the H.264 format option up here towards the top are some of these presets. In this drop-down menu, you can target specific devices like the Kindle Fire or an Android phone or tablet. And as you scroll down, you can target Apple TV and iPads and iPhones and iPods. As you continue to scroll down, you'll see that there's options for Barnes & Noble's Nook tablet, as well as some standard options. But what's really great down here towards the bottom is that there's options for YouTube and Vimeo. Oftentimes, what people will do is take a video that's been exported and upload it to YouTube or Vimeo. And oftentimes, those services have to re-encode the video to a format that's acceptable for their platform. The problem with that is the quality of the video gets reduced. So if you can come in here and target YouTube or Vimeo specifically, you know that your video is already encoded to their specifications and they don't have to re-encode it. They can simply use it. So again, I just wanted to point out that these options exist. If you want to create a copy of your video that you're going to export for the web, you should really take a look at the H.264 format, which is, like I said, the most universal format available, and then take a look at some of these presets. When you're done exporting your project and you're essentially done working on it, you probably want to archive it. It's a good idea to archive your project through Premiere. Now, you certainly could do it outside of Premiere, but the chance of you running into a problem greatly increases. So how should you approach it? Well, what you should do is come up to the File menu. And from the File menu, you can come all the way down to the bottom and you can choose Project Manager. Once you choose that, a dialog box opens. And you'll notice that you have all these different sequences. So you want to make sure that you have the sequences that you want to use. But you really have to be careful about this as well. Depending upon how complicated some of your projects are, you may have nested sequences and things along those lines that don't immediately pop out to you as one of the sequences that you've created. Now, you can collect all the files and copy them to a new location. Personally, I like to create a new trimmed project. The new trim project will get rid of anything that you didn't use within the project. To create that new trimmed project, you'll select the Consolidate and Transcode radio button. You'll also notice that you can include handles up to 24 frames. That way, if you have video clips with long handles, those will be truncated, again, saving you some file size. You then want to come down here and choose a project destination. Oftentimes, you're going to select a different hard drive. So I'm going to come over here and do that now. I'll select this different hard drive and I'll click Choose. Once you click Choose, you'll notice it's now pointing to a different directory. And we can come down here and calculate the disk space that's going to be required for this archived project. So once you're done with that, you can come over here and click OK. It will create a new project folder for you in this location. I strongly recommend opening it up inside of Premiere to make sure that everything is linked up properly. And if it is, at that point, you can get rid of the project that you are working on. You can even get rid of the media as long as that media isn't used in other projects that you have currently in progress in Premiere. But this is a great way to be able to preserve all of your work and have the ability to open it up six months, two years down the road without really having to think about the process of archiving. Premiere does it all for you. Well, that's going to conclude this course, Premiere Pro CC Fundamentals. At this point, you have a very strong foundation of the application, and you certainly have the necessary skills to start cutting your own projects. If you're interested in learning more about Premiere, you may want to take our next course, Premiere Pro CC Building on the Fundamentals. In that course, we're going to talk about multicam projects, filters and effects, and how you can enhance your audio. Outside of that, if you have a greater interest in video production altogether, Trainsimple.com has several different courses on Adobe's other video and audio applications, like After Effects, Audition, Prelude, Speedgrade, and Story. But that's going to wrap it up for now. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you can take what you've learned here in this course and start applying it to your own work.